to this is one this audio check one two
Lastly, he was accompanied by his wife, the parliamentary representative of the Muso Central constituency, Honorable Melissa Skerrit. Prime Minister Skerrit will present the estimates of expenditure for the financial year ending June 30th, 2022, in the amount of 993 million. Six hundred and forty-five thousand two hundred and ninety dollars. Very soon, the Parliament will get on the way with the formal entry of the Speaker. The Speaker will come in and take his seat. There will be prayers, the adoption of the order paper. The sitting will then be suspended to allow for the President to enter and to deliver his address. The President is to speak on any topic of his choosing and for any length of time he so chooses. Following the President's address, the President will depart the Parliament and then will go into obituary and congratulatory remarks when the House resumes. The confirmation of the minutes from the sitting of Monday, June 28, 2021, announcement by speakers, and then the presentation of papers. A contingent of police officers and fire officers joined by the Music Lovers Government Band, the Dominica Government Band, which is headed by ASP Theophil, is here and uh, the president, of course, will take a guard of honor, following which he'll inspect the troops and then he will enter parliament. So this is what is taking place here today. The budget is being presented against the backdrop of the COVID-19 pandemic that has plagued the globe since 2019. Dominica, as you know, was not spared the ravages of COVID-19 and we had a serious drop in revenue, but that did not pause Dominica's progress towards development. We see in this budget an estimate and allocation of $75 million towards the construction of the International Airport. This $75 million is another tangible step towards the construction of the International Airport. On June 9th, 2021, we saw the signing of the agreement between the government of Dominica and MMCE for the construction of the International Airport, the development and construction of the International Airport. And of course, this airport is being built without the use of loan do well for this country, a program which continues to bring tremendous benefits for Dominica. Throughout the last financial year, we saw the efforts through the CBI, through the construction of the um, health and wellness centers across Dominica, six of them having been opened thus far. The, we are talking about in Bagatelle, we are talking in Maho, in Viecas, in uh, Wesley, and of course, the other um, health and wellness center was opened in Georgetown, Portsmouth. So we are about to see the formal entry of the speaker and we can take in the sites what is taking place here at Parliament and of course uh, the Government Information Service in collaboration with the Office of the Prime Minister media team. We are ensuring that this is broadcast live to you here on your televisions and throughout the globe through the internet. So let's take in the sites. We'll see the police officers, the contingents outside, and very soon we'll see the beginning of the first meeting of the second session of the 10th Parliament. Yeah. 
bifocus di, 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 di affaccio da, da drone automatico di affaccio yeah. you taking audio from that now? when 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 the thing when the uh, when the pressure when the pressure when the plane you take the audio check 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 check
Almighty God, who in thy infinite wisdom and providential goodness has appointed the offices of rulers and councils for the welfare of society and the just government of man. We beseech thee to behold with thy, thy abundant favor as thy servants whom thou hast been pleased to call to the performance of such important trust in the Commonwealth of Dominica. Let thy blessings descend upon us here in this parliament assembled and grant that we may, as in thy presence, treat and consider all matters that shall come under our deliberation in so just and faithful a manner as to promote thy honor and glory and to advance the good of those whose interests thou hast committed to our charge, all which we ask in the name and for the sake of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. It has been moved and seconded that the other paper be adopted as amended. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. Suspension of sitting. I now suspend the sitting in order to meet His Excellency the President.
On the occasion of the first meeting of the second session of the 10th Parliament, I, George Deville, Superintendent of Police Acting in the Commonwealth of Dominica Police Force, do have the distinct pleasure in presenting to you the guard of honor comprising of two platoons from the Commonwealth of Dominica Police Force, one platoon from the Dominica Fire and Ambulance Services, one and the Dominica Government Band. They are formed in two ranks, dressed in open order, awaiting the pleasure of your inspection. Your Excellency, May you please inspect the car. You want me to go across there?
you're ready. You should be all set, ready, not sure? All right, let's go. Let, let, let them, let them have a stick. I will now invite His Excellency the President to address the House. Mr. Speaker, honorable members of this House of Assembly, your excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, a very pleasant good morning to you all as we give thanks and praise to God Almighty with a grateful heart for he has been good to all of us. Mr. Speaker, I wish to thank you most earnestly for the kind invitation which you extended to me and my dear wife, Clara, to attend this first meeting of the second session of the 10th Parliament and for government at the time of independence, but whose vision it was to take Dominica into independence as declared in the Salisbury Declaration of 1976. <clears throat> Mr. John's place was firmly inscribed in our history as the first Prime Minister of Dominica. He departed this life on Tuesday 6th of July, 2021, after a long period of illness. Mr. Curtis Augustus, a lifelong friend of Mr. Patrick John, suddenly passed on Friday, 9th July, 2021, after suffering a massive stroke two days earlier. Mr. Augustus served as an opposition senator during the life of the interim government of 1979 to 1980. What must be widely known as the Secretary Treasurer of the Waterfront and Allied Workers Union, WAU, and former General Secretary of the Caribbean Congress of Labor. <clears throat> to the widow of Patrick John, Mrs. Desri John, and to his children and grandchildren, I extend my deepest sympathies, and likewise, I extend my deepest sympathies to the widow of Curtis Augustus, Mistress Lyris Augustus, and his children. Mr. Curtis Augustus was laid to rest on Monday, the 26th of July, 2021, having been accorded an official funeral, as is customary regarding former members of this honorable house. And I have no doubt that Mr. John, as a former Prime Minister, will be accorded the courtesies due to him. I also wish to take note of the passing of the President of Haiti, His Excellency Jovenel Moise, who was shot and killed at his residence by foreign mercenaries on Wednesday, the 7th of July, 2021. We extend our heartfelt condolences to Mrs. Moise, who was herself injured in the shooting incident, to the government and people of Haiti, and to the Haitian community 
resident here in Dominica. This tragedy in Haiti should cause us some pause as a similar fate almost befell us in February of 1981 and again later that year in December of 1981. We are also reminded of the mutiny led by the Sandhurst trained former lieutenants Rafik Shah and Rex LaSalle, which took place during April of 1970 at the Tetran Barracks near Shago Ramos in Trinidad, which threatened the overthrow of the government of Prime Minister Dr. Eric Williams of Trinidad and Tobago and the Jamaat al Muslim coup attempt at overthrowing the government of Prime Minister A.N.R. Robinson of Trinidad and Tobago, initiated on February the 27th, 1990. On Friday, that is, the 27th of July, 1990. The Prime Minister, A.N.R. Robinson, had been beaten and shot when he tried to order the army to attack with full force, but he survived. We should also recall the Grenada Revolution of March 1979 and the counter revolution which resulted in the death of Prime Minister Morris Bishop in October of 1982. It is therefore with an extraordinary awareness of our political history in the region and a sense of loss for us here in this honorable house and in Dominica that I address this august body on this most noteworthy occasion. Mr. Speaker, in the intervening years since our independence in 1978, we have overcome many struggles, challenges, and difficulties along the way. These experiences, followed by miraculous rebound, accentuate the fact that we are truly God's children and the sheep of his pasture. We therefore need to thank God for constantly coming to our rescue in our darkest hours. I wish at this juncture to commend Honorable Greta Roberts, Minister for Governance, Public Service Reform, Citizen Empowerment, Social Justice, and ecclesiastical affairs, and other members of the cabinet for the initiative taken in the month of June to designate a three-day period of prayer and fasting as an indication of gratitude to give thanks to our Creator God for his countless blessings, goodness, grace, forgiveness, and love, and asking for his mercy and protection during this hurricane season, which falls in the midst of a resurgent global COVID pandemic. Mr. Speaker, following the passage of the two major natural disasters of Tropical Storm Erica in 2015 and Hurricane Maria in 2017, and prior to the emergence of the COVID-19 pandemic in early 2020, Government realized that business as usual could no longer be an option to address the significant effects of these disasters that kept impacting us with increasing frequency. In light of Dominica's high vulnerability to natural disasters, government saw that the answer to responding to and mitigating against future disasters lay in boosting resilience and thus, the Build Back Better and Stronger approach was adopted in the Recovery and Reconstruction Plan, focusing on the areas of health, education and training, tourism, agriculture, housing, and physical infrastructural development. Our commendable performance and achievements and high expectations for 2020 who brought to an abrupt halt by the emergence of a new challenge in January of 2020, 
the coronavirus or COVID-19 pandemic, which has had governments around the world operating in a context of tremendous uncertainty, triggering the most serious worldwide economic crisis since World War II. Commonwealth countries are estimated to have lost up to US $345 billion worth of trade in 2020, including $60 billion in intra-carry Commonwealth trade, according to the 2021 Commonwealth Trade Review on Energizing Commonwealth Trade in the Digital World, Paths to Recovery Post-COVID-19. Mr. Speaker, when I addressed this House on February 10th, 2020, COVID had already spread to at least 28 countries and was responsible for around 910 deaths and about 40,500 confirmed infected cases. The Caribbean, Dominica included, was not directly impacted then. Dominica recorded its first case of the coronavirus on March 22, 2020. To date, the global picture shows that the virus has spread to some 220 countries and territories with over 195,705,870 reported infected cases, over 14,071,399 active cases, some 4 million 188,862 deaths and 177,445,609 recoveries. The United States of America, India, Brazil, France, Russia, Turkey, the United Kingdom, Argentina, Colombia, and Italy are the top 10 countries most severely impacted. After intermittent periods when we had zero active cases and overall reported infections of less than 100, we continue to see increased imported cases and currently we have some 210 overall imported in reported infected cases, 10 active cases, zero deaths, and 200 recoveries. We are rated as a low-risk country by the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, along with the sister islands of Grenada, Angola, and Montserrat, and remain one of the safest countries to visit. The recent spike in active cases from 2 to 13 was due to a single incident of six imported cases. The Ministry of Health has responded with alacrity to contain the spread by deploying health teams to conduct contact tracing and instituting a seven-day lockdown, which has now been lifted in the community in the Southeast, which was impacted. All in all, Mr. Speaker, it can be said that we have and continue to do well in managing and containing this life-threatening disease as the government, businesses, local communities, and individuals collaborated and acted swiftly and strategically to impose unprecedented containment measures wherever and whenever necessary. The fact that the situation is not as chaotic in Dominica as it is in the rest of the world does not in any way suggest that we can become complacent as the virus has a very high presence in neighboring islands coupled with the fact that there is the continuous emergence of new variants which are more virulent and transmissible. Therefore, every person who enters the reports, whether legally or illegally, 
is a potential carrier of the virus, and we must continue to ensure vigilance and strict compliance with the Ministry of Health's COVID protocols, including prompt notification to the authorities of any illegal entry into the island. The virus continues to pose not only a health threat to entire populations, resulting in high hospitalization and death rates, but also severely impacting livelihoods, business activity, and the economy in general, even in the most developed countries. Mr. Speaker, we were advised by the public health experts that a new normal involving wearing of face masks, temperature checks, hand washing, and social and physical distancing will be here with us for some time, at least until there is a general uptake of viable vaccines in every country in the region and across the globe. The public health experts have warned that the exit strategy from the COVID crisis will not be a straightforward exercise. There will be periods of lockdown and reopening of economies until all countries have succeeded in getting their people vaccinated and achieved herd immunity. In a nutshell, Mr. Speaker, vaccination at the national and global levels is the only viable exit strategy from the COVID-19 crisis. In December of 2020, the world was introduced to three clinically proven safe and effective vaccines, namely Pfizer, Moderna, and AstraZeneca. To date, there are at least 13 different vaccines available and are being administered by at least 214 countries and territories. Dominica started its vaccination rollout program on the 12th of February 2021, first administering the AstraZeneca vaccine donated by the government of India and later the Sinopharm vaccine donated by the government of the People's Republic of China. Science has confirmed that there is no other way for any country to achieve herd immunity and get past this pandemic without nationwide vaccination. According to the World Health Organization, WHO, the Pan American Health Organization, PAHO, and the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, herd immunity occurs when enough people become immune to a disease to make its further spread unlikely. Various governments have been overly burdened with the task of convincing the adult populace to take the prescribed COVID vaccines. Some governments have gone so far as to offer incentive packages to encourage a wider uptake of the vaccine. Here in Dominica, we have set ourselves the task of getting 70 to 80% of our adult population, that is some 50,000 persons, vaccinated so as to achieve herd immunity protection. We have been struggling to meet this target. Currently, the total number of vaccinated persons stand a little above 20,784 persons, that is 41% of the targeted adult population. Mr. Speaker, honorable members, the coronavirus is the most beleaguered situation confronting us, our region, and the world today. It is not a hurricane, nor a tropical storm, nor even an earthquake. These are events which are localized, devastating as they may be, they are seldom global. The COVID pandemic is an insidious malaise 
gnawing at all the vital components of civilized living. We must therefore cooperate to fight and eliminate the common enemy, the coronavirus, together. We must do so without being sidetracked by our political, religious, and other differences or persuasions, but by focusing on our civic responsibility and on the extraordinary challenges and difficulties that confront us as a people and a nation on a daily basis. Recent reports from the international news networks confirm that the new surge of COVID-19 cases is most common among the unvaccinated populations, including young adults. We need, therefore, to take full ownership of the vaccination rollout program and be more aggressive in our awareness and advocacy campaigns. The messaging has to be more persuasive to our young adults and elderly people alike. I wish to take this opportunity to thank the Honorable Dr. Irvin McIntyre, Minister for Health, Wellness, and New Health Investments, for taking the lead and guiding his ministry in coordinating this effort. I also wish to commend the members of this Honorable House who are fully vaccinated and advise you, all of you, both on the government and opposition benches, to encourage others in your neighborhoods and constituencies who have not been vaccinated to do so as a matter of urgency, as the achievement of herd immunity protection is very critical to the return of any semblance of normalcy, not only here in Dominica, but in our region and across the globe. In the alternative, Mr. Speaker, consideration may have to be given to making vaccination mandatory, or at the very least, limitations may have to be placed with respect to access to certain services regarding persons who refuse to be vaccinated for no legitimate reason. This matter has already been addressed by law professor Rose Marie Bell Antoine, Dean of the Faculty of Law at the University of the West Indies campus in Trinidad, when she said that, and I quote, it's a fairly easy sell for me to accept that mandatory vaccination is constitutionally legitimate, and we have good precedents for it since we already have laws mandating vaccines for children entering school, uncle. No decision has been taken on that score here, but Professor Antoine sees no legal or constitutional hurdles. Persons who discourage others from being vaccinated are doing a tremendous disservice to themselves, their family members and others, and to the country by extension. Our ultimate goal should be to play our part in ending this pandemic by taking the vaccine and encouraging all those who have not done so to also get vaccinated against COVID-19. We owe this to ourselves and particularly to the vulnerable ones in our midst who are unable to take the vaccine for valid medical reasons. As I mentioned earlier, we have made and continue to make significant strides in our national recovery and reconstruction efforts, particularly in the aftermath of Tropical Storm Erica and Hurricane Maria. Although we have suffered significant setbacks, as focus and resources had to be diverted to address the COVID-19 pandemic. Government therefore took an in-depth look at the significant impact of the COVID-19 pandemic in its health, economic, social, and fiscal dimensions and adjusted its post-Erica and post-Maria recovery 
and reconstruction plan to make the country and the economy more resilient and responsive to the unprecedented circumstances of the COVID-19 crisis. Consequently, we have been able, after some delay, to proceed with a series of plans and programs that are geared at ushering our country into a new development paradigm. These include the development of the new international airport, continued progress with our geothermal energy program, our new road infrastructure development program, our new Dominica China Friendship Hospital, and a new Northeast Hospital in Marigot that are nearing completion. 12 new health, health and wellness centers, our housing revolution program, our international hotel construction program, focus on reviving the agriculture and fisheries sectors, ushering in our new digital economy initiatives, development of a cruise port and cruise village at Woodbridge Bay and a major hotel on the site of the old public works garage, and continued efforts in improving air access into Dominica via the Douglas Charles Airport, resulting in an, in an announcement by American Airlines in its press release of July 23, 2021, that as at December 8, 2021, it will be launching its new international direct service from Miami to the Douglas Charles Airport in Dominica to be operated on a bi-weekly basis, that is Wednesdays and Saturdays. Mr. Speaker, I wish at this juncture to commend the government on the following decisions taken recently that are all geared at accelerating the transition to a new dynamic Dominica. First and foremost is the signing of an agreement to undertake the single largest infrastructural project that this country will witness for quite some time, the construction of the long-awaited international airport. Dominica needs to build its international airport, not because other islands have international airports, but because we are transitioning our economy from an agriculture and goods-based economy to a tourism and services-based economy. And an international airport is critical for the development of this new thrust in our tourism and services-based economy and to support our expanding hotel sector. A vibrant tourism economy will bring thousands of jobs to a cross-section of the population stimulate the commercial sector, and create markets for the produce of farmers, fishers, craft workers, processors, and manufacturers. The entire economy and population stand to benefit, and therefore we must all embrace the international airport project without reservation. Secondly, Mr. Speaker, the passage of the Dominica Hospitals Authority Bill at the seventh meeting of the first session of the 10th Parliament on Monday the 28th of June 2021. This act is one of five pieces of legislation which taken together are expected to enhance the delivery of healthcare services to the citizenry with a strategic focus on strengthening accountability and transparency within an accreditation, accreditation framework, thereby placing our hospital services on a level to offer high-end services, not just locally, but regionally and internationally. And thirdly, Mr. Speaker, responding to the call from the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union, the ECCU, to all member countries of the Union to enact fiscal responsibility legislation. This legal framework, which is still to be approved by this Honorable House, is simply meant to reinforce financial discipline across member states 
and to reduce fiscal deficit. Ultimately, this would increase transparency in government's management of public funds and put the country and the sub-region in a position to better respond to future health, economic, social, and climate-related shocks. Mr. Speaker, there is a matter of great concern to me that I wish to highlight at this time, and it has to do with the perception of impunity regarding incidents of disorder and lawlessness taking place in this beautiful island that God has blessed us with. I wish to draw our attention to section one of chapter one of the Dominica Constitution, which states, whereas every person in Dominica is entitled to the fundamental rights and freedoms, that is to say, the right, whatever his race, place of origin, political opinions, color, creed, or sex, but subject to respect for the rights and freedoms of others and for the public interest to each and all of the following, namely, A, life, liberty, security of the person, and the protection of the law. B, freedom of conscience, of expression, and of assembly and association, and C, protection for the privacy of his home and other property, and from deprivation of property without compensation. The provision of this chapter shall have effect for the purpose of affording the protection of those rights and freedoms, subject, Mr. Speaker, subject to such limitations of that protection as are contained in those provisions being limitations designed to ensure that the enjoyment of the said rights and freedoms by any person does not prejudice the rights and freedoms of others or the public interest." End of quote. In a nutshell, Mr. Speaker, our Constitution bestows certain fundamental rights and freedoms on every one of us, and we have the right to enjoy the said rights and freedoms. I am and have always been a firm defender of those rights. However, while enjoying those rights and freedoms, we do not have the right to prejudice or infringe upon the rights and freedoms of others and to go against the public interest. The rights and freedoms that are guaranteed by the Constitution are not absolute and are subject to limitations in the interest of public safety, public order, public morality, and public health. These exceptions are provided for in subsections 10.2, 11.2, and subsection 12.3 of the Dominica Constitution. Mr. Speaker, the development thrust, which I highlighted earlier, should instill in us a great sense of hope and optimism as Dominicans, whether living at home or abroad. Notwithstanding the global crisis, there will be opportunities to be embraced in certain fields of endeavor in the current and post-COVID world, more particularly in the digital transformation of the economy. The coronavirus crisis shows that the digital revolution can serve as a useful platform for improving our country's resilience to crises. It shows that while the well-established businesses benefit from access to digital solutions that are in place, for instance, collaboration tools, cloud storage, and connectivity, this is not the case for small and medium-sized businesses. It is therefore crucial for us to continue to take concrete and actionable measures that will provide access for all to quality, to qualify for digital infrastructures that will support the development of the digital economy. I envisioned that the Caribbean Digital Transformation Project valued at US $28 million will do so. 
Additionally, the digitalization of the economy can foster growth and increased opportunities in other avenues, such as digital technologies, offshore medical services, risk assessment and insurance, project management, renewable energy, e-commerce, online education, and employment, entertainment, and gaming, etc. We need to take ownership of this growth perspective and ensure that no one is left behind. Tremendous opportunities will also become available to us in the construction phase of the international airport as well as when it becomes operational. Let us therefore embrace these new opportunities as they unfold and maintain our focus and concentrate all our efforts on the National Recovery and Reconstruction Plan designed for the emergence of a modern, resilient, and sustainable Dominica. Remembering the words of King Solomon, as written in the book of Proverbs, chapter 3, verses 5 and 6 in the New International Version, and that is, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. Uncle. Mr. Speaker, I pray for God's continued blessings and his peace upon all members of this honorable house, and all those present here today, and all the citizens and residents of our blessed country, including those citizens residing abroad in the diaspora. I therefore extend to you every good wish for a fruitful and successful session. I thank you for your patience and attention. Speaker, I, I move that uh, message of thanks uh, be forwarded to His Excellency the President for his address uh, to this Parliament this morning. Uh, an address which I believe all of us will agree uh, was very timely and identified some of the salient issues confronting not only Dominica but the region and the world. Thank you.
Second it, Mr. Speaker. The question is that the message of thanks be forwarded to His Excellency the President. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes are. Auditory and congratulatory remarks. Mr. Speaker, I rise to uh, make a few uh, obituary remarks, Mr. Speaker, on the passing of the late Patrick Roland John, former Prime Minister of the Commonwealth of Dominica. Mr. Speaker, the late Prime Minister Patrick Roland John started from very humble beginnings, very much like most of us in politics today, Mr. Speaker. He grew up, young man, um, his family, he had a lot of siblings, Mr. Speaker. His mother was a very humble lady uh, and always admonished him. From even the days before he entered politics, to continue to remain humble, continue to know where he came from and remember that, and always to look out for the less fortunate among him. I think words that uh, stood him in good stead even when he entered the field of politics. Mr. Speaker, the late Prime Minister started off after having attended secondary school at the St. Mary's Academy. Again, he was uh, a bright guy in his time, a good student, so he was drafted back into teaching at the St. Mary's Academy. He spent a few years there, Mr. Speaker, and later moved on to HHV Richard, where he worked uh, in the um, shipping agency. And I believe it must have been that surgeon that he did in the shipping agency that brought him into contact uh, with the uh, Waterfront and Ally Workers Union, Mr. Speaker, which uh, he later championed. And it was his involvement in uh, the union that must have cemented or crystallized uh, his move eventually into politics. Even before um, he got um, into mainstream politics, he was a member of uh, the Roseau City Council. So all of his life, he has been, or he was a people's person. He was a very avid sportsman. I believe he ended up eventually playing football for Dominica, Mr. Speaker. Very, very good sportsman. I think he played football on the forwards for uh, Dominica for a very long time, Mr. Speaker. And that in itself also helped him in his later life when he became the president of the Dominica Football Association and, uh, have, uh, and did a tremendous job. Uh, anybody you speak to in football today will tell you that Patrick John, um, as the president of the Dominica Football Association, in fact, he was the one who established the football house in Buffalo State and really took our football uh, to great heights and, and we were very recognized and respected um, during his stewardship, Mr. Speaker. But it is his, his time in politics that really cemented his place in the history of Dominica. He became the, the premier of Dominica in the 1975, after the 1975 election when I believe the Labour Party uh, launched the electrifying team after the uh, retirement of the father of the nation, Edward Oliver Lee Bly in 1974. Uh, Patrick Roland John uh, came to the helm of our great party and our country, Mr. Speaker. And he made some very noteworthy contributions to the economy of Dominica, to the socio-economic advancement as started under Edward Oliver Lee Black, the Labour Party continued into the late 1970s when we won the election in 75. So, for example, people who don't know initiatives like the Kingfield Airport was initiated by the Dominican Labour Party under Patrick John. A number of the housing schemes and people uh, always ask themselves why is Buffalo State 
such a bastion of the Dominican Labour Party, even today. It is because of the work of Patrick John. He was the one who established the Buffet State Housing Scheme. He was the one who established the Canefield Housing Scheme. And a number of other in Union Estate, in Point Michel, a number of those are uh, initiatives. He did some homes also in the Marigot area, Mr. Speaker. And very much like what the Dominican Labour Party is doing today, our housing revolution has its roots in the Labour Party of the 1970s, in what Edward Oliver Libla and later Patrick John uh, established, and we continue in that vein. A great institution that is established in Dominica today Mr. Speaker, the Dominican Social Security, which was, uh, which came after the uh, Provident Fund, was established by Patrick John, Mr. Speaker. And the National Bank of Dominica was also established by the Dominican Labour Party under Patrick John, and I believe uh, Captain Vic Rivera was the Minister of Finance at the time, Mr. Speaker. And Patrick John had always exposed a socialist view, very much like the Dominican Labour Party. And that's why we are rooted in the philosophy of Paul Shakti, because Patrick John always looked out for the little man. And there was always a play on the term and the phrase, the little man, because he was such, he was diminutive in nature. He was a, a, a short guy in nature. Uh, so he was really the man of the little man carrying on, Mr. Speaker, the great traditions of the Dominica Labour Party. And Dominica went through a transition at that time, Mr. Speaker, in our pre-independence uh, era, when more of the responsibilities of running the state was being handed down uh, uh, to us from uh, the, our colonizers um, and Britain, because we were not independent yet, Mr. Speaker. Patrick John tried a number of initiatives. And I believe without getting into the details, Mr. Speaker, here, yeah, he really tried to advance the socioeconomic development of Dominica. And perhaps he didn't sell those issues as well as he should. And perhaps he didn't engage the populace as well as he should, Mr. Speaker. So initiatives um, he entered into. Uh, like the development of the north and the cabrits and the 47 square miles, Mr. Speaker. And the, the, the politics at the time um, may have not have afforded him the benefit of the doubt. And so that started off an avalanche of events, really, that uh, resulted in the demise of the Dominican Labour Party leading up to, to 1979 and the unfortunate incidents which unfolded there, Mr. Speaker. And we, as young up-and-coming politicians, uh, would do well to learn from the events of that time, Mr. Speaker, and to ensure uh, uh, that uh, those events never occur again um, in the history of our country, Mr. Speaker. So um, it is with those words, Mr. Speaker, I, I, I really want to express on behalf of the government on behalf of more particular the Dominica Labour Party, Mr. Speaker, our, our condolences and our sincere best wishes to his wife, to his children, Mr. Speaker Nairi and, and his sister, and all of the um, children of the late uh, Prime Minister Roland Patrick John for his contribution to the socio-economic development of our great country, the Commonwealth of Dominica. And to the Dominican Labour Party. Thank you very much, Mr.
protected moments ago by the outcome of the court of constituency. Because indeed, Patrick John was teacher, trade unionist, sportsman, cricketer, football, and national level, sports administrator, cricketer, football as well. He was also a cultural enthusiast, very interested and passionate about our cultural traditions. He was a songwriter as well. Who does not know the lines? One flag, one blood, one people, one nation. Something that seemed to call out his, his heart and the life that he lived in terms of being there for everybody and wanting to see all two things and all rising and all coming out together. And as we go on this past thing, Mr. Speaker, we must let the truth be spoken about the unfortunate incident you referred to a while ago. Because we see every time we come and talk the truth, we want to stop. Members of the other side, who I'm sure are sad at the passing of Patrick Young, know very well that some of their colleagues described his demise as being a victim of the constitutional who wash the game back in 1979. For the very same economic initiatives and national development programs that the member for Portsmouth suggested a while ago may have been misunderstood, or which he may not have sold well enough to the people around me. But be that as it may, his ending in the term of office where he served as Dominica's first prime minister was most unfortunate. And it is one of the lessons that. We need to take the heart, not to be excavated the past and try to make the best sense of it going forward. He served this country well. May his soul rest in peace. strong but very respectful and I believe that Mr. Speaker uh, the trade union movement in Dominica and in the world and in the world is a bit worse off today with the passing of Curtis Augustus. I had the privilege of engaging him on many matters not only on, of trade unionism but matters of national development and I must say that those engagements were always mutually respectful and uh, common sense always prevailed, always prevailed um, at those occasions. So I wish to extend my sincere sympathies and condolences to his wife and his extended family. Mr. Speaker, I also want to place on record my sincere condolences to the family friends and well-wishers of the former Prime Minister, Patrick Roland John. 
our first prime minister, the person who took us into independence. I will not go into the issues of history uh, because there's, there's some who may want to recall history to suit their own circumstance and their own machinations. Um, but it is interesting to note, Mr. Speaker, that that which some are speaking about is that the very same thing that these same people are trying to do to Roosevelt Skerritt as the Prime Minister of this country. But this will not happen, Mr. Speaker. This will not happen. So I recognize the contribution made by Patrick Roland John to Dominico. Profound contribution. And I believe it's important for us as the current generation of Dominicans to record his contribution properly and appropriately so that succeeding generations can appreciate his contribution to the life and the development of our country. He came from the bowels of the Dominican Labour Party, a party that has been created on principles and a philosophy of people first. And this is what this Dominican Labour Party is propagating in our country, putting people first and putting our country before self and party. And so I recognize this contribution. I believe, Mr. Speaker, that it, it, it has to come to a point when our parliament will be mature enough to put in place legislation on how to recognize and treat with former prime ministers of a country. It was okay for the cabinet to have taken the decision to provide him with an allowance and means of transportation, but it should not be merely purely by a policy decision. I believe it should be by legislation, um, as was done in the case of our first premier, uh, E.O. Libla. We brought here an act of parliament to have it effected. So may his soul rest in peace, and may his family get the strength and courage, and let us all be united on the single point that he made his student contribution to Dominica, Mr. Speaker. And not allow his death to seek to bring rancor and, and, and division in our country, but to focus on his positive contribution that, that he made to the development of our country. And this is what I wish to focus on, Mr. Speaker. While I'm on my feet, Mr. Speaker, if you allow me, I would like wish to extend congratulations to uh, Philip J. Pierre and the Senator Labour Party for the outstanding victory. For the outstanding victory, Mr. Speaker. Um, the people of Senator spoke, and everyone has accepted the results. And what, is, what I believe parliamentarians here in Dominica should emulate is what has been done by former Prime Minister Alan Chastney. Moments after the polls were given, the results were given, he came out as a statesman, respecting the rule of law, respecting the will of the people of St. Lucia, and recognized that Philip J. P. and his St. Lucia Labour Party were victorious at the polls. <laughs> and Mr. Speaker, his victory really is a regional and indeed an international recognition that when countries are faced with challenges, they turn to progressive parties, they turn to labor. And the people of St. Lucia, the people of St. Lucia recognize that they're in difficult times, and it is labor who they believe have what it takes to get them out and to give them the hope and to bring the prosperity with the St. Lucia people. And I believe we have seen it here in Dominica on numerous occasions. Thank you very much. It would, it would you want to say something? Yes. Yes, member. Mr. Speaker, I stand on behalf of the parliamentary opposition to extend our condolences to the family of Curtis Augustus. Outstanding trade unionist in his time, but also a sportsman of note. And someone in whose re relationships 
whose life and work in the community was exemplary as a uniter. He always sought to bring people together. He always sought solutions to the problem. And uh, what good could come out of the situation that confronted the people? So, so he was that kind of person. And uh, there are those like, of, of us like myself who have been in meetings with him over the years. I know him better from my days in Barbados because we both served as Dominicans in Barbados at the same time. Uh, he was the Secretary General of the Caribbean Congress of Labor, and I was uh, working at the Caribbean News Agency back in the 1980s, and we saw a lot of each other in those days, but we always joked, because I'd ask him once, where did you get the nickname Palace? Because I never understood the term until he explained to me it meant pa las. He's not tired because of his exploits on the football field. He was running and running and running. When everybody else was sitting down taking a break, he pate las. He was moving on. He lived a marvelous life, an exemplary father, exemplary friend, brother, father, husband, and on behalf of my team in the parliament, we extend our condolences and we wish him well as his soul rests in peace. Mr. Speaker, I also would like to extend congratulations from the parliamentary opposition to my friend of more than 30 years, Philip J. Pierre, the new Prime Minister of St. Lucia. Philip J. Pierre, Philip J. Pierre has served the people of St. Lucia in the Parliament for a very long time. Very, very long time. He has had his years in opposition, he has had his years in government, back to opposition, back to government, opposition, now back to government as the Prime Minister. And we wish him well. <laughs> Philip Pierre, however, Philip Pierre, however, contested or led his team into an election in respect of which we didn't hear anything about list. We didn't hear anything about playing loads of people coming from overseas to vote. We didn't hear anything about treating. We didn't hear anything about election offenses running rampant and amok in the election period. And so I understand exactly why. My friend, Alan Shastney, would almost immediately, learning of the results, reach out to congratulate the Honorable Philip Peer as the new Prime Minister of St. Lucia. Don't talk about St. Lucia as though you don't understand the circumstances are different in Dominica. When we have free and fair elections of integrity, where I'm concerned, I will be the first to stand and concede defeat. We wish Mr. Philip Pierre well. We wish the St. Lucia Labour Party well. And we wish the United Workers Party well in its continuing service to the, gov to the government, the governance, and to the people of St. Lucia. Members of this Honorable House, it will be remiss of me not to extend sympathies to the family and friends of Patrick Roland John. Patrick Roland John was dear to our family, my family. He was the godfather of both my brother and my sister, and almost a proxy godfather to me. I remember the days as a child when Thomas Baptist, that's deceased, that's the grandfather of Honorable Hippolyte, 
my father Johnson Isaac, people like Cecil Larock and Mr. Harris, they would come home after their Combomia football team victories and would spend hours talking. I was a child then, so I can't remember exactly what they spoke about. But Mr. John was really a visionary. And therefore, I want his children especially, as I told them, we are brothers and sisters, to really feel proud of Mr. John, because he was a humble man, but very determined. And I think what all of us should learn, all of us, that regardless what the battle is in sports or politics, we need to always respect our opponent and move dignified. That is what we should remember him, how we should remember him. Also, I had the privilege also to grow up in River Street, close to Mr. Curtis Augustus, who was a very, very humble man, deep, frank, but humble. And he always used to give advice, deep with wisdom. So I would like to also extend my deepest sympathies to him, to his family, sorry, and his friends. Let us not forget those champions of Dominica. I would like to also extend congratulatory um, message to the leader of the St. Lucia Labour Party, Mr. Philip Pierre, especially my friend and brother Joachim Henry, who came from behind and actually proved everybody wrong and won. I want to place on record that at the time, while being a minister in the Dominica Labour Party administration, Joachim Henry came to Dominica to help us rebuild in Russo Central. So again, I really want to show the appreciation and extend that congratulation to him. Let's proceed with House Matters. Confirmation of minutes. Mr. Speaker. Before, before the confirmation of the minutes, Mr. Speaker, I wonder if you could pay attention to page 22. Page 22. Page 22. Announcement by the Speaker. And uh, confirm the last paragraph in which it is reported that the Honorable Speaker, in conclusion, said in regards to the substantive matter, he was minded to follow the line of argument brought by the Honorable Prime Minister. The Honorable Speaker said, however, he would like to do further research on the said matter, and if the House erred in the decision by following the advice of the Honorable Prime Minister, the matter will be corrected through an administrative mechanism. If that correctly represents you, Mr. Speaker, Maybe you could advise whether that further research has been done. And uh, yes, um, uh, on page 22, yet yes, it correctly reflects what I what I said. And yes, I did further research on the matter, and I maintained the decision as proposed by the Honourable Prime Minister. So that was the decision. So back to the substantive matter of the minutes now. Um, it, yes. Page three. Yes. Page on on the second line. It says the late Mary. Lee Luge. It should be Lee Tham Luge. Lee. Lee. Yeah. Lee Zan. Lee Tham. L E A T H A M. Okay. So, okay. So on page three, the Honorable Danny Luge requests that it be amended to read the late 
Mary Lee Fam Lugi. Yes. Yes. Page three. Stella Tusi. Supposed to be Helen Tusi. Helen Tusi. On page three, Senator John Finn requests an amendment to read the late Helen Tusi. It has been moved, and maybe we should move now again. <laughs> As Mr. Speaker, yeah. I move that the minutes of the meeting of Monday, 29 June 2021, be confirmed as amended. It has been moved and seconded that the minutes of the meeting of June 28th 2021 be confirmed as amended. Those in favor? Those against? The ayes have it. Yeah. yeah. Announcement by speaker. been, I would say, successful as a nation in containing and managing the spread of the COVID-19 virus thus far. I must say that in light of this, I would like to sincerely apologize to the many persons we normally would have invited to the budget's budget presentation. Because of the COVID-19 pandemic, we had to limit the number of people invited. Very limited numbers were invited. I would also like to inform all our invitees and members of parliament that we have taken all measures to follow the COVID-19 protocol as outlined by the Ministry of Health so I request that all of us here adhere to the wearing of masks and also doing the hand sanitization when leaving the chambers or the gallery, that is in and out of the chambers or the gallery. When, when members are presenting, they can remove the mask. But I'm urging that all members wear masks. We hand over masks to everyone. Presentation of papers. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I beg to give notice that at a little stage of the proceedings, I am removing the motions and taking all stages of the bill, standing in my name on the other paper. Dominica Economic and Social Review for financial year 2020-2021. Government notices. It's a 
Mr. Speaker, I beg to lay the following papers on the table. Proclamation for in Parliament, SRNO number 14 of 2021. Proclamation reconvening Parliament, SRNO number 15 of 2021. Draft estimates of revenue and expenditure for the financial year 2019-2020. by ministers. Public business, government business, motion. Expenditure of estimates for the financial year ending 30th June 2022. Be it resolved that this Honorable House approves the estimates of expenditure for the financial year ending 30th June 2022, amounting to 993,645,290 dollars the details of which are contained in the draft estimates of the Commonwealth of Dominica for the year ending 30th June 2022. Uh, Mr. Speaker, cabinet colleagues, members of this honorable house, distinguished guests, Mr. Speaker, we live in extremely challenging and unprecedented times. The world is in a perilous state. Globally, we see protests, conflicts and upheaval, wars and rumors of war are part of the daily news. Climate change is wreaking havoc with the natural and built environment. Wildfires consume and sweep across large swaths of land. Water scarcity and food shortages now abound worldwide. We are witnessing the health, social, and economic consequences resulting from what can be considered a modern plague and pestilence in the form of the novel coronavirus, COVID-19. In the Caribbean, we have seen a volcanic eruption impacting multiple islands. And we have witnessed early in the season a hurricane making landfall on a sister island whose last encounter with a hurricane was over six decades ago. Citizens of every country struggle to come to terms with these wide sweeping changes while leaders and governments adapt an attempt to find solutions where there are no models to guide them. Yet, in these times of uncertainty and upheaval, we take comfort in the encouragement provided by Psalm 31. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. As your Prime Minister, duty and love of country compel me to find solutions, provide resources, and foster hope. Hope which is capable of inspiring a nation and propelling it forward. Your government must press firmly and unwaveringly towards the dynamic Dominica promised by the Dominica Labour Party. The dynamic Dominica with a strong, sustainable economy, 
which our citizens desire and deserve. I present this year's budget against the background of the difficulty of these days, but with the unshakable faith that despite these challenges, there are great opportunities for our country, Dominica. We have demonstrated that we have the skills, resilience, and fortitude to navigate successfully these most difficult national challenges and global circumstances. Mr. Speaker, I want to begin by tracing our path here and then look forward to the trajectory which this administration intends for our country. It is a trajectory which will take us to dynamic Dominica. There may be de delays, disappointments, and challenges along the path. But as a government and people, we must not and we will not be deflected from our objective of dynamic Dominica. Almost four years ago, we could have easily descended into extreme poverty, severe economic contraction, and despair. But by God's grace, by God's amazing grace, and strong and determined leadership, this administration steered the country on a path that has allowed us to experience and enjoy a remarkable recovery from the devastating storms of 2015 and 2017. In early 2020, following loss and damage of over 300% of GDP caused by Tropical Storm Erica and Hurricane Maria, the International Monetary Fund had focused strong growth of Dominica's economy by 5.5, 4.5, and 3.6% for the years 2020, 2021, and 2022, respectively. However, global circumstances changed rapidly. Little did we know that these difficulties were strengthening us and preparing, preparing us to be able to confront the global health, social, and economic crises brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic. Mr. Speaker, the COVID-19 virus is the biggest health crisis that this world has had to face in this century, with global recorded infections edging towards 200 million people and the number of deaths exceeding 4 million. With prudent action and the support and cooperation of our citizens, we have managed to date to limit infections in Dominica and prevent community spread. In fact, in fact, of the countries for which data is found on the John Hopkins coronavirus tracker, as of July 23rd this month, Dominica has had the 12th lowest number of cases in the world and, and zero deaths. We thank God for this, Mr. Speaker. We could not have achieved this without the invaluable commitment and support of our healthcare and frontline workers. And I wish to once again thank them on behalf of my government and the people of Dominica. As of Friday, 23rd July, 42% of the adult population are fully vaccinated, and an additional 3% are partially vaccinated, having had the first dose. I am well aware that there continues to be some degree of vaccine hesitancy among our citizens. But the evidence has proven that getting vaccinated reduces the chances of contracting the virus, severe illness, and death. The vaccine is not a cure, but the evidence shows it is an important safeguard. I therefore urge all eligible citizens to get vaccinated, as this is the only way that we can effectively beat the virus, resume full and normal social activity, and speedily revive our economy. Mr. Speaker, I wish to place on the record of this parliament Dominica's deepest appreciation to our partners 
in the fight against the COVID-19 virus. The government of the People's Republic of China, the government of the Republic of India, as well as the benefactors of the COVAX facility for making vaccines available to our population. We also extend gratitude to the governments of the Republic of Cuba, the government of the Bolivian Republic of Venezuela, the World Health Organization, the Pan American Health Organization, the Caribbean Public Health Agency, and the World Bank, OPEC, CDB, IMF, and all other partners who have been assisting and aiding in our fight against this dreaded virus. Mr. Speaker, Dominica stands firm today, not by chance, but by the grace of God. Our collective efforts, the commitment of our development partners, decisive leadership, and careful and strategic planning of this government. This government, which I have had the honor to lead over the past 17 years, has been following a deliberate plan to develop Dynamic Dominica. We have adopted and pursued progressive, transformative policies, investing in our people and their livelihoods, improving our infrastructure, and increasing and expanding services to the public. Dominica is now a prominent, credible voice on climate resilience and sustainability. In every social and economic sector, there is clear evidence of government's efforts towards transforming Dominica into a modern, resilient, and vibrant country with a sustainable economy and prosperous people. Mr. Speaker, the reality is that small island developing states like Dominica have limited resources and restricted fiscal space. Despite this, and the difficulties posed by global circumstances, this government's ability to mobilize resources, particularly from non-traditional sources, and our prudent management of the country's finances have resulted in the continued development of this country. And Mr. Speaker, this is without placing any additional tax burdens on the population. In building resilience, fighting climate change, and laying a development path to Dynamic Dominica, this government has had to be innovative. We are ahead of most in that we have crafted a comprehensive national resilience development strategy, a climate resilience recovery plan, and a disaster resilience strategy, which presents a clear framework for us to 2030. These are designed to ensure that we protect lives, livelihoods, and property, and create opportunities for our people. This framework has helped us in preparing the groundwork for the mobilization of a significant amount of financing from the Green Climate Fund for some transformative projects. Detailed proposals are being finalized for eight priority projects in the areas of agriculture, health, education, development, and deployment of renewable energy, housing, and community development. Preparatory work in respect of some of them have begun and is reflected in the budget, and we anticipate that within the next two to three years, substantial progress on these major projects will be realized. Mr. Speaker, to achieve dynamic Dominica, to achieve resilient Dominica, there are some key matters that must be addressed. No one can deny that air access has been a critical issue that has held back the pace of our development in this country. We are now on the cusp of revolutionizing life and business in Dominica. Construction of our international airport has begun and this is a major game changer for us here in Dominica and our country. The international airport will be the impetus for the further diversification, transformation, and expansion of our economy. And I am honored to lead this thrust to even more prosperous days for our people and our country. Mr. Speaker, 
There is no denying that the global landscape is challenging and the task at hand is not easy. But the promise I made, the commitment that I continue to make to substantially improve the lives of the pe good people of this country, of this our blessed nation, is what guides my every action. So regardless of the perils of the global landscape, the hurdles, the challenges, the distress and difficulties, Mr. Speaker, it is in this spirit of being progressive and forward-thinking and caring and concerned about the plight of our people that I compiled this budget for 2021-2022. And so I present this year's budget under the theme, Dynamic Dominica, Building on Our Past, Solidifying Our Present, Securing Our Future. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the implementation of the Public Sector Investment Program, PSIP, for fiscal year 2020-2021 was shaped by the need to adjust to the socioeconomic impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, while simultaneously building the nation's resilience to respond to similar shocks in the future, together with continuing our efforts to construct Dynamic Dominica. Financing constraints and competing spending priorities to save lives and livelihoods impacted the implementation of domestically financed projects. As such, priority focus was on, on, on ongoing projects, while some considerate considerable effort to facilitate new projects. I will now provide a sectoral summary of some of the achievements for fiscal year 2020-2021. Further details on project implementation are contained in the Economic and Social Review publication for the fiscal year 2020-2021. Mr. Speaker, over the last two decades, this Labour Party government has made substantial investments in healthcare, recognizing that the health of a nation is paramount. I can boldly say that we are indeed successfully revolutionizing healthcare in Dominica for the better. We have prioritized the development and the upgrade of our healthcare facilities, the improvement in the delivery of health services, augmented our human resource capacity, improved access, and widened the range of available services. Under the Smart Health Care Facilities Project, aimed at developing resilient and climate-adapted healthcare facilities, four facilities are being refurbished. The Grand Bay and Portsmouth Smart Retrofit are both 95% complete and will soon be handed over. Work on the health centers in Trafalgar and Massac are also ongoing. 12 new and wellness centers have been completed. Of these, Maho, Portsmouth, Bellevue Chopin, Vekas, Wesley, and Marigot have been commissioned, while the other six, Penville, Ansdeme, Collyhoe, Bacatel, Soufre, and Newtown will soon be handed over. Over the past fiscal year, phase two and phase three of the Dominica China Friendship Hospital were completed. These include four operating theaters, an eight bed intensive care unit with two isolation rooms, a new blood bank, and a modern ophthalmology unit with its own operating theater. Our investments in the physical structures are complemented by the investments that we have made in supporting our doctors and nurses in specializing in different disciplines. Many of our doctors have in fact returned to Dominica to serve in the areas of cardiology, nephrology, oncology, and gastroenterology, to name but a few. Mr. Speaker, with the establishment of the cardiology unit at the Dominica China Friendship Hospital, we have been able for the first time in the history of this country to implant a temporary pacemaker in a patient. Yes. An achievement we should all be proud of. Mr. Speaker, we intend to continue investments in this area to ensure that soon 
we will be able to implant permanent pacemakers and eventually undertake heart surgeries in Dominica. It is evident that we are steadily and progressively increasing the number and complexity of medical procedures, procedures that are afforded at our hospitals. This is in keeping with our strategy, if not to eliminate, but to drastically reduce the need for our citizens to travel overseas for medical emergencies. Mr. Speaker, as part of a commitment to ensure more efficient and effective healthcare service delivery to Dominica, the Dominica China Friendship Hospital, the Marigot Hospital and, and other health facilities will be brought under the administration of the Dominica Hospital Authority, recently approved by the Parliament. This new governance structure will come into operations on August 1, 2021. Mr. Speaker, in respect to tourism, there is general consensus that globally, the tourism industry has, was the hardest hit by the pandemic. This was inevitable because of the number of restrictions placed on regional and international travel. This is confirmed by the World Trade, World Travel and Tourism Council's economic impact report for 2020, which has documented that the pandemic has caused the Caribbean's GDP to fall from $58.4 billion, that is 14.1% in 2019, to $24.5 billion, that is 6.4% in 2020. So from $58.4 billion in 2019 to $24.5 billion in 2020. And the region's economy to fall by US $33.9 billion and a loss of some 680,000 travel and tourism jobs. In Dominica, our growing tourism industry was significantly affected and government moved swiftly to implement a number of measures to cushion the impact on our people and to provide support to them. This included income support to head of households and single parents for one year concessionary loans for up to $15,000 with a one-year moratorium on interest and principal payments. The novel coronavirus has changed the world of work and the ways in which people work. We have therefore developed tourism products that respond to the new realities of the global labor market. In this severely constricted environment, in an attempt to min maintain a tourism product while ensuring the safety of visitors and nationals alike, the government launched two programs, Safe in Nature and Work in Nature. Both programs focus on allowing visitors to experience the beauty of this country and are expected to increase visitor arrivals and sustain the livelihoods of the operators in the tourism industry. The Safe in Nature Certification Program, which has become synonymous with Dominica, was launched in October 2020 and has ensured the survival of tourism during the pandemic. To date, 70 properties, equating to 705 rooms, have been certified as Safe in Nature accommodation. Mr. Speaker, in the words of the tour operators, hoteliers, and guest house owners. This innovative program, which was initiated by the government, has provided a lifeline to them as they were able to continue to receive guests during this challenging period. The other innovative program which the government launched in March 2020 is the Work in Nature program which provides visitors with the opportunity to live and work in Dominica. This program lends itself to tremendous opportunities for Dominica in the foreseeable future as a new tourism product. Mr. Speaker, Dominica has been placed on the United Kingdom's green list and categorized as level one by, you, by the United States Center for Disease Control and we have obtained the World Travel and Tourism Council Safe Travels stamp. 
These are these are actions, Mr. Speaker. All about well for us here in Dominic. They identify our country as a safe destination for tourists and opens the door for travel by our nationals without being barred from entry into international destinations. It, this is a clear indication of the effectiveness of the policies implemented by this government to manage the COVID pandemic. Yes. Yes. Mr. Speaker, there are flashes of good news for agriculture, even in the midst of current difficulties. Amid the challenges and restrictions of the COVID-19 lockdown, which resulted in the shrinkage of the travel and tourism sector and reduced domestic activity and spending, the agricultural sector has shown its resilience and continues to expand. Government has been investing heavily in that sector, recognizing its significant contribution to the growth and development of Dominica. Over the past two years, investments in the agricultural sector and our farmers amounted to over $33.8 million. This includes $27 million under the Dominica Emergency Agricultural Livelihoods and Climate Resilience Project to support the restoration of the agricultural sector. As of May 28, 2021, 3,485 farmers and fisher folks have benefited from this project. 2,702 farmers received crop input packages consisting of fertilizer, agrochemicals, seeds, and tools, of which 2,208 received cash payments to subsidize their labor costs. 3,900 bags of feed for pigs and 18,000 chicks were distributed to poultry farmers. That's chicken chicks. 96 fisher folks received engines consisting of both 50 horsepower and 100 horsepower. 605 micro garden farmers received input packages. In addition, Mr. Speaker, the Chinese Agricultural Mission in collaboration with the Ministry of Agriculture has been instrumental in providing seedlings and technical support to our farmers. Between January 2020 to May 2021, over 490,000 seedlings, high quality vegetable seedlings, Mr. Speaker, 17,000 flower seedlings, and over 2,000 fruit trees were propagated and distributed to our farmers. This is significant, Mr. Speaker. With government support, the agricultural sector continues to provide opportunities and revenue for households, for hundreds of households and farmers across Dominica, including our young people who see this as a viable investment opportunity. And what we're witnessing, Mr. Speaker, is also the fact that a number of professionals and private sector people are now investing in agriculture, bringing in new monies into agriculture, and this is certainly good for the future of agriculture in Dominica. Yeah. And that is important. Very encouraging science, Mr. Speaker. I know of one farmer who has not gotten any help from the government in the, from the private sector is planting some 5,000 avocado seed and plants, prepared himself for a major export market. I also take this opportunity, Mr. Speaker, to highlight the commitment of the Dominican hucksters and sheepers under extremely difficult circumstances caused by COVID-19. They have supported the sector by maintaining weekly shipments to our regional markets of some of our main crops, such as bananas, dashin, plantains, ginger, pumpkins, among others, and they should be highly commended for this business. Mr. Speaker, the government continues to support new avenues for investment in the agricultural sector. In the last fiscal year, we re-established the prawn hatchery. This has allowed farmers to source locally the larvae to grow full-size prawns, 
some of which are being supplied to our hotels and restaurants right here in Dominica. This is just one of the many examples of the linkages between agriculture and tourism and the diversification and expansion of our product offerings. Mr. Speaker, this Labour Party administration is also known as the housing party in Dominica oh, and yes. in the Caribbean. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Government continues to invest heavily in improving the life, living standards of our people. In fiscal year 2020-2021, an estimated $50 million was spent on constructing, constructing, constructing homes under the Modern Resilient Housing Program. Under the, under the Housing Recovery Project, financed with loans from the World Bank, the construction of homes has started after some delay. On completion of this project, it is expected that 450 new homes will be built for our people, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Additionally, under the Sustainable Housing Solution Project, 92 families have received homes, and an additional 16 homes are currently under construction. Last year, Mr. Speaker, we introduced two additional measures to facilitate homeowners. We reduced the cost of land registration by over 48 percent, and this measure has, has been significantly impactful on our, to our citizens. I am pleased to report that the total number of requests for titles during the fiscal year 2020-2021 was 71 percent above the previous fiscal year. So when we take a measure, we induce yes. activity, Mr. Speaker, and that is what the government is doing, facilitating investments in our country. We also provided a grant of $10,000 to first-time homeowners, 40 years old and under, to encourage people to build their own homes. We can also report that 114 individuals, 40 years and younger, have benefited from the Home Owners Grant. <laughs> For total benefit of EC, $1.1 million. Many of whom told us that they only decided to start building because of this assistance they'll get it. Because those of us who are building know every dollar counts, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, in our climate resilience and recovery plan, Dominica has targeted and is working towards having 90% of the housing stock built or retrofitted to resilient building codes. Regional technical assistance centers have been established in Portsmouth, the Carnegie Territory, Bellevue Chopin, and Maho, under the direction of the Physical Planning Division to support citizens and ensure compliance with building codes. We are pursuing several avenues of support simultaneously to improve housing in Dominica. We have continued the home renovation and sanitation program. Under this program, financial assistance has been provided to homeowners to undertake major renovation works, such as roof repairs or replacement, and we have supported the construction of new homes. Assistance has also been provided to construct washrooms and toilet facilities, and to replace doors and windows. The housing revolution started by this government continues across the length and breadth of Dominica. Hundreds of homes built to withstand earthquakes and hurricanes have already been constructed. Hundreds of families no longer have to worry about getting wet when it rains, yes. or packing their belongings and heading to shelters when a storm is threatening. Yes, yes. They no longer have to live in fear of loss of life or property during the hurricane season. Yes. We see people living with dignity, with their heads held high, proud of their climate resilient homes and improved living standards. Yes. I say, Mr. Speaker, to our citizens that I personally rest better at night knowing that my government has been able to make a difference in the lives of thousands of our citizens. Yes. And, that, and that in turn, 
these citizens are able to sleep better at night. But we shall not waver in our commitment until every single family in this country is provided with a decent, safe, and comfortable home to call theirs. Yes. And this is an absolute solemn commitment that I give on behalf of the Dominican Labour Party, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, with regards to the digital economy, innovation and the use of ICT is now pivotal to our country's sustainable development. We accept that the world is changing, and we are committed to leading on the new frontiers which define these changes. Every sphere of activity, from education and learning, to recreation, from work and business, to socializing, formal and informal communication, from entrepreneurship to market development and penetration, depend on technology. Technological change will lead to the creation of sustainable jobs and to new investments. During the last fiscal year, government secured a loan of EC $75 million from the World Bank to fund Dominica's digital transformation. These funds will facilitate the digitalization of government services, as well as the improved access to online services, skills, and technologies among individuals and businesses. Additionally, digital initiatives were also pursued, including a work online program, where 60 participants were provided with skills training for accessing online opportunities for income generation. The success of this program was evident as 50 out of the 60 participants were successful at securing online jobs. The program was facilitated with the support of the UNDP and Israel. A second group commenced training on the Work Online Dominica program in June 2021. We intend to continue to provide these opportunities for our people, particularly the youth. Mr. Speaker, these are all real important and tangible steps on the way to dynamic Dominica. It is against this backdrop of challenges and hurdles, coupled with solid gains and progress, that I now turn to the presentation of, of Dominica's macroeconomic performance for the fiscal year 2020-2021. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, like other countries in the region, Dominica's economy continues to experience the impacts of COVID-19 as it attempts to rebound from the pandemic. Based on the revised projections provided by the National Monetary Fund in May 2021, economic activity in Dominica contracted by 11% in calendar year 2020, owing to reduced activity in all of the main sectors of the economy, including construction, tourism, wholesale and retail trade, and transport. On the other hand, increased activity in the dominant agricultural sector was, gain, was again evident in 2020. Mr. Speaker, the agricultural sector registered a second year of positive growth and expanded by 2.1%. Output on the crop subsector increased by 2.3%, while livestock and forestry each grew by 2% following expansions in the previous years. The strong performance of the agricultural sector is a reflection of the implementation of strategic projects and programs by this government, recognizing its importance to livelihoods, maintaining food security, and the economy. The data suggests there was also a 3.5% expansion in manufacturing, again, a second consecutive year of expansion as investments in small and medium enterprises continue to generate economic returns. Financial intermediation, real estate and rents, electricity and water all recorded positive growth in 2020. Mr. Speaker, central government's fiscal position improved with an overall deficit of $97.9 million recorded in fiscal year 2020 2021, 
down from 163.2 million in fiscal year 2019-2020. In relation to GDP, the overall deficit moved from 11.1% in fiscal year 2019-2020 to 6.9% in fiscal year 2020-2021. This improved performance was attributable, attributable to higher collections of revenue and grants, which more than offset the recorded growth in total expenditure. Total revenue, inclusive of grants, rose by 37.8% to $825.1 million, primarily as a result of higher inflows from non-tax sources. The higher collections of revenue provided the required financing for government to effectively respond to the COVID-19 pandemic, both in terms of health and livelihood support and investments in the major productive sectors. By contrast, tax revenue was lower in fiscal year 2020-2021 by $36.2 million when compared to the previous year and by $32.1 million when compared to last year's estimates. The economic impact of the ongoing pandemic has continued, resulting in lower than, expect, than estimated revenues in most main tax categories except taxes on income and profits and property tax. Mr. Speaker, total expenditure rule $1 million $762.1 million in the previous year, driven primarily by higher outlays on public sector investment projects as government reduced recurrent expenditure. The public sector investment program remains the main fiscal tool used to stimulate economic activity. Current data shows an increase in expenditure on the PSIP from $156.4 million in year 2019-2020 to $431.7 million in fiscal year 2020-2021. This expenditure was financed by $391.1 million from local funds, CBI resources, $25.9 million from grants, and $8.6 million from loans. This outturn exceeds the original budget estimate. Based on preliminary data, recurrent expenditure was reduced by 18.9% in fiscal year 2020-2021. Decreases have been realized in all components of recurrent expenditure except personal emoluments, which showed a slight increase in both salaries and allowances. Mr. Speaker, it is important to note that notwithstanding the decrease in expenditure, there were salary increases. No public officer was sent home. And all programs continued during fiscal year 2021. We were still able to provide support to various groups and productive sectors of the economy. Mr. Speaker, with the current trends in expenditure, government is expected to return to a primary balance surplus of 1.2% by fiscal year 2023-2024 as the economy continues to expand, thereby shoring up tax revenues. Mr. Speaker, bearing in mind the need to cushion and adapt to the adverse impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the economy, and conscious of the thrust to transform the economy, government contracted additional debt in fiscal year 2020-2021. This was to fund our COVID-19 response and recovery program in health and agriculture, to provide support to individuals and small businesses affected financially by the pandemic, and to assist with financing the digital transformation program and the rehabilitation of the East Coast Road under the Disaster Vulnerability Reduction Project. Consequently, as of June 30, 2021, central government's disbursed external debt stood at $771.3 million and domestic debt at $548.5 million, while government guaranteed debt was $148 million. The guaranteed debt represents 10.1% of the total debt portfolio, 
which is below the target of 17% set in the medium-term debt management strategy. Mr. Speaker, in May 2020, in an effort to provide liquidity to assist with the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic, the G20 members and other creditors offered a one-year debt repayment moratorium to countries through what was referred to as the Debt Service Suspension Initiative. Under this initiative, Dominica received a debt suspension of $17.24 million, or 26.8% of the debt service due for the financial year 2020-2021. On behalf of all Dominicans, I wish to express appreciation to the government of the People's Republic of China, the government of the United Kingdom, and the government of the Republic of France for the moratorium granted to Dominica. Mr. Speaker, despite the adverse impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on Dominica's fiscal position, we honored all our debt service obligations in a timely manner throughout the fiscal year. Central government's debt service payments for the period under review was $47.1 million. Government also provided support to Aid Bank and Duasco to meet their debt service obligations. Moving forward to fiscal year 2021-2022, debt service repayment by central government is projected at $93.9 million, comprising principal of $58.3 million and interest of EC $35.6 million. Guaranteed debt repayment for that same period is projected at $17.3 million. There were no breaches of the targets set in the medium-term debt management strategy, even in these most difficult circumstances. This government has continued with the prudent management of the country's finances. We are also committed to achieving the debt-to-GDP ratio of 60% and maintaining sustainable debt levels well in advance of the 2035 target agreed to by the Monetary Council of the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union. Mr. Speaker, a critical cornerstone of any resilience plan is the ability to sustain one's self during and after a crisis. Extreme weather events will occur, and so will pandemics and global economic downturns. We must be prepared to always position ourselves, individually and collectively, to be able to respond effectively to such shocks and minimize disruption of normal activity. As the saying goes, we must save for rainy day and refrain from overcommitting our finances in order to meet the extraordinary expenditure which will arise when adverse events occur. In last year's budget address, I indicated that government had decided to implement a number of measures to build greater resilience to economic shocks. I am pleased, therefore, to provide an update on government's implementation of these measures. In October 2022, sorry, 2020, the Vulnerable Vulnerability Risk and Resilience Fund was established to assist with disaster expenditure. And it is held in a special account, Mr. Speaker, at the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank. An amount of $500,000 is deposited in that account every month. The deposits were drawn from CBI revenues. And as of today, July 20, 2021, the balance in this account stands at $5 million. In the event of a disaster, this fund will give the country some degree of cushion and an immediate pool of funds from which to draw. It is this government's intention to increase the monthly contribution when the economy improves. Government shall also mandate every government-owned company and statutory corporation to establish a similar vulnerability risk and resilience fund. In December 2020, Cabinet formally approved the Disaster Resilience Strategy as an annex to the Climate Resilience and Recovery Plan. The DRS was developed with the assistance from the IMF, and its implementation is being spearheaded by CREED. Mr. Speaker, 
a three-year medium-term debt strategy, debt management strategy for the period 2021-2022 to 2023-2024 will also be laid in Parliament later this year. The anticipation is that this strategy will guide government's borrowing and assist in achieving the desired debt portfolio in line with the strategy. The total public sector debt will be monitored constantly to ensure that there are no breaches of the targets approved in that strategy. We have also, we have also increased our insurance coverage with the Caribbean Catastrophe Risk Insurance Facility, CREE, by 31.5% for tropical cyclones and 12.5% for earthquakes. Looking ahead, government has begun engaging with the World Bank to, to secure a catastrophic deferred drawdown facility. This facility is yet another source of funds which government could access in the case of an emergency occasioned by a natural disaster or other qualifying events. All of these actions which I've outlined will result in government's access to a diversified portfolio of mechanisms and instruments to finance its operations and post-disaster responses and allow the country to recover much faster. Mr. Speaker, insurance for the protection of citizens' lives, livelihoods, and properties is of extreme importance. Yes. As a result, in May 2021, in partnership with a number of entities, the blockchain parametric product, the Flexible Hurricane Protection, was piloted in Granby, at the Granby and the West Coast Credit Unions. In the one-month pilot, Mr. Speaker, that this product was available, 28 individuals took up policies. The flexible hurricane protection product is being further developed and refined and a wider national rollout is expected prior to the 2020 hurricane season, providing insurance opportunities for the most vulnerable among us, Mr. Speaker. We continue to support its development as an important risk management tool, as it is absolutely important that the vulnerable, Mr. Speaker, are able to access and purchase insurance coverage. Yes, yes. Mr. Speaker, according to the IMF's World Economic Outlook, dated April 20, 2021, the global economy is expected to rebound in 2021, following a contraction of roughly 3.3% in 2020. It is projected to grow by 6% and 4.4% in 2020 and 2022, respectively. Economic activity in Latin America and the Caribbean is projected to expand by 4.6% and 3.1% respectively, <clears throat> based on the IMF's publication. The outlook for our country is also promising. Based on revised projections provided by the IMF in May 2021, Dominica's economy is projected to grow by 3.4% in 2021. Driven in large part by increased activity in construction and agricultural sectors, with a ripple effect evident in other sectors like the wholesale and retail trade and mining and quarry. Developments in the manufacturing sector are also expected to contribute to the increase in real output. The projected growth in 2021, led by the planned acceleration in the implementation of the PSIP, will be largely financed by proceeds from the Citizenship by Investment Program. In financial year 2021-2022, approximately 58% of the capital budget, equivalent to $253.3 million, will be funded by the resources from the CBI. The construction of the International Airport, financed by the CBI, is a flagship project in this year's budget. Yes. This is this highly anticipated project, the largest government investment in our country's history, will yield significant economic gains for the duration of its construction and during its operation. Yes. Improved air access and the numerous jobs created will inevitably 
result in economic prosperity for the country and people alike. Additionally, a number of ongoing CBI-funded private sector initiatives are expected to continue in this financial year. Among them, Tranquility Beach Resort Hilton Hotel at Grand Savan in Salisbury, Sanctuary Rainforest Eco Resort and Spa at Loda, Anarchy Resort and Spa Marriott Hotel in Portsmouth, and of course, Secret Bay with residences in TB Portsmouth, while at least two newly approved projects are expected to commence. According to the IMF's May 2021 forecast, Dominica's economy is expected to grow by 8.1% in calendar year 2022, with growth averaging 5.5% per annum over, over the medium term. It is clear that the CBI program continues to have a positive, life-changing impact on our people and the economy, and indeed justifies its own existence. And that is why, Mr. Speaker, it is in the interest of all of us to protect it and defend it, not to seek it yes. 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 Mr. Speaker, the outlook for 2021-2022 is expected to show a further improvement in central government's fiscal position, consistent with the projected rebound of the economy. All of the major components of tax revenue are expected to improve with taxes on domestic goods and services showing the largest overall improvement. Non-tax revenue reflected by mainly by CBI revenues is expected to play a significant role in stabilizing central government's finances. Overall recurrent revenue for 2021-2022 is expected at $853.1 million, an increase of $29.4 million, 29.4%, sorry, over the projected actual revenue for 2020-2021. Table two in the printed text gives a summary of the estimates of revenue uh, for 2020-2021. The major contributors are value added tax, 143.5% or 16.8%, international trade tax, 76.3%, $76.3 million or 8.9%, other domestic taxes, $66.1 million or 7.8%. Non-tax revenue, $492.3 million or 57.7%. Personal income tax, $30.9 million or 3.6%. Corporate income tax, $33.7 million or 4%. Mr. Speaker, this is, very, this is a very positive outlook and sets the context for the presentation of the budgetary proposals for the fiscal year 2021-2022. Total recurrent expenditure for the fiscal year 2021-2022, inclusive of those provided by law, is estimated at $650 million. Mr. Speaker, the Ministry of Finance has the largest allocation of the recurrent expenditure to the tune of $266.1 million of 40.9% of the total. Of this amount, $94.8 million is for debt servicing payment, $41.5 million is appropriated for retirement benefits, which includes payments of gratuities, pensions, compassionate allowances, contractual gratuities, and non-contributory pensions, and $12.5 million has been allocated for the one-off salary payment to public officers for the fiscal year 2018-2019 following negotiations with the union. The Ministry of Education, Human Resources, Human Resource Planning, Vocational Training, and National Excellence will receive the second highest allocation of 11.8% or $77 million. Mr. Speaker, this government will continue to invest in the development of our young people consistent with this Labour Party's administration's philosophy of using education to transform the country, advance our people, elevate our youth, and impact the world. The third largest budgetary allocation in the sum of $59.9 million, or 9.2%, is to the Ministry of Health, Wellness, and New Health Investment. 
The Ministry of Public Works and the Digital Economy is allocated $58.9 million, or 9.1% of the total budget. An amount of $54.7 million, or 8.4% or of the total budget, is allocated to the Ministry of National Security and Home Affairs. The Ministry of Tourism, International Transport and Maritime Initiatives, and the Ministry of Youth Development and Empowerment, Youth at Risk, Gender Affairs, Senior Security, and Dominicans with Disabilities have been allocated $18.1 million and $19.4 million, respectively. Mr. Speaker, this government has consistently placed particular emphasis on two very important demographics of our society, the youth and our senior citizens. In that regard, we have injected additional funds into the Youth Skills Training Program, and we continue to maintain our Yes We Care program, our 17 over non-contributory pension, and other support to our seniors. Mr. Speaker, the social and economic disruptions caused by COVID-19 have created a greater urgency to rationalize public sector investments and make them more responsive to the changing global environment. Government will therefore continue to invest in a number of high growth sectors, such as agriculture, manufacturing, construction and tourism, the international airport, expanding the use of renewable energy, encouraging a culture of entrepreneurship, promoting Dominic as a green and safe tourism destination, and creating a social financing facility at the aid bank for small and medium-sized enterprises. The intention of government by making these investments is to foster diversification and the resilience of the economy. They are also intended to promote an entrepreneurial class and to boost local businesses and domestic enterprises. These investments will define the new economy of Dynamic Dominica and help to create a modern world-class society in which our citizens, our youth, and our seniors can have their dreams fulfilled here at home without having to migrate for greater opportunity and a better life. Mr. Speaker, the Public Sector Investment Program for fiscal year 2021-2022 is estimated at $438.9 million and financed as follows. Local funds, $253.3 million or 57.7%. Loans, $64.8 million or 14.8%. And grants, $120.8 million or 27.5%. And of course, the others are captured, Mr. Speaker, in details in the um, printed text, making, as I said, for a total of $438.9 million. The digitalization of our economy. Mr. Speaker, in today's interconnected world, digitalization and technology are the bridge to our future. A modern, resilient, and sustainable, dynamic economy must be supported by technology. Over the medium term, investments will be focused on creating a modern ICT system with island-wide coverage that allows for the integration of ICT in education, business development, transportation, and homes that can facilitate remote work, remote learning, and access for citizens to engage in a range of activities. Mr. Speaker, some of the important programs planned for this fiscal year include the procurement of 8,000 tablets for primary school students, the conduct of a feasibility study for a new national health management information system. This system will provide efficient and effective service in the health sector, as well as evidence-based information for decision making and the establishment of a computer emergency response team, CERT, in order to ensure that the information systems are safe against any cyber threat or attack. Importantly, laws and policies that cover e-transactions and digital signatures will be reviewed and updated to ensure that online transactions are protected by law. The project will also make provision for digital skills, for digital skills development, by building the capacity of micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises throughout the island. It is anticipated that when trained 
entrepreneurs will be able to effectively promote, market, and sell their products and services on various digital platforms, which will no doubt generate business and foreign exchange. During the month of September 2021, the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, in collaboration with this government, will introduce in Dominica the digital EC currency, commonly known as Dcash. The introduction of Dcash will facilitate the reduction in physical cash transactions and foster economic growth, resilience, and the competitiveness of Dominica. Local businesses, such as restaurants, bars, taxis, for example, will be able to accept payments with their smartphones. We are aware that some individuals are not in possession of bank cards, while many small businesses are of the view that the point of sale systems are too expensive. These easy payments and transfers can be effected in person by simply scanning a code on the receiver's smart device and or remotely by having the payer enter the receiver's unique ID and inserting the amount we paid and clicking send. Dcash is legal and secure and offers a safer, faster, and cheaper way to conduct business. Of course, Mr. Speaker, more information will be given to the public during the coming months. But this is going to be an important opportunity for a number of the small and micro businesses across Dominica, increasing, <laughs> increasing the transaction. But the reality is most tourists who come to Dominica don't work around your cash, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, an economy that is powered by renewables resulting in reduced energy, reduced energy costs and carbon emissions, while simultaneously creating jobs, is one of the cornerstones of the economy of Dynamic Dominica. Work on the geothermal development project in the Rosa Valley has accelerated over the past year. Construction of two additional wells in Loda has started. With the finance, financial and technical support of the World Bank, we recently conducted five procurements valued at over EC $35.1 million associated with the drilling of these wells. This includes the civil works for access roads and well pads for which a contract of $9 million was awarded to Ace Engineering Limited in May 2021. Yes, yes, yes we, we also We are also at an advanced stage for the selection of an engineering procurement and construction contractor to build a 10 megawatt plant. We expect to conclude negotiations by the end of September this year and soon thereafter to issue a notice to proceed with construction of the, of the power plant. Construction time is expected to be 18 months from issuing the notice to proceed. The transfer of power from the geothermal power plant in Loda to the main load centers in Fokole and Sugarloaf will require higher voltage transmissions, transmission lines. We are working closely with Dominic and the Independent Regulatory Commission to develop this new network. The new transmission lines will also contribute to a more resilient electricity electricity network by providing redundancy for transmitting power from the existing hydro stations in the Rosa Valley. The progress which we are making on this project would not be possible without the support and cooperation of the people of the Rosa Valley, as well as the World Bank and many friendly governments. And Mr. Speaker, we are very appreciative and grateful of this support. Yes. Mr. Speaker, in tourism, this government is making major investments to facilitate the transformation of the tourism sector. We are approaching tourism development from all angles. Dominica has been singled out by the cruise lines as one of the countries in the Caribbean with the best quality road network. This signifies the tremendous efforts by this government to upgrade roads throughout the island. And this year, we will begin the reconstruction of the Layo Valley Road and accelerate, accelerate work on the East Coast Road. Both are arteries to major tourism sites. One of the aims of this government is to increase opportunities for visitors to spend more in Dominica. We are pursuing several avenues 
to fulfill this objective. One of these is the Roseau Enhancement Project. We are transforming Roseau into a modern, attractive shopping, hospitality, and entertainment center with amenities which will allow visitors to enjoy day and night life, thereby increasing and creating business opportunities for our people. Mr. Speaker, we have also pursued the upgrading of our sites and attractions to make them more appealing and accessible to our visitors. In this financial year, we will see substantial improvements to some of our most visited sites and attractions in areas such as Champagne Beach, Scotshead, Indian River, Trafalgar Falls, Emerald Pool, Watton Waven, among others. In addition, a complete audit and redesign of the Waitikubuli National Trail will be undertaken to allow for its full rehabilitation and reconstruction. Our trails and sites are the basis for this unique appeal of Dominica. As such, it is important to continue to take bold steps towards management, preservation, sustainability, and marketing and monetizing of these assets. We recognize that government's investments in these tourism assets will be more meaningful with the participation of all key stakeholders. Government will therefore establish an authority to oversee all aspects of trails and sites in Dominica. The authority will coordinate the development, maintenance, financial management, and conservation under one legal authority. Mr. Speaker, our increased use of technology in the economy will improve the country's ratings among visitors, particularly those from developed countries who are accustomed to technology as a way of life. Dominica can now boast of having three five-star hotels and another three are under construction. These investments will substantially increase the number of export-ready rooms available on island and be an impetus for attracting more visitors and more business to our shores. They are also encouraged, they also encourage a vibrant staycation culture. By 2023, an additional 498 rooms will become available. This is a massive investment, a massive achievement in a short space of time for a small country like Dominica. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The tremendous investments towards increasing productivity of the agricultural sector will reinforce the backward and forward linkages between these two growth sectors. Farmers and fisher folk can rely on the tourism sector for a constant and secure market. And hoteliers can assure the guests that their food is grown locally. We are currently propagating and producing a number of crops, livestock, and seafoods to supply the major hotels. As we expand the agricultural sector, there is no doubt that we will be able to fully supply all of the hotels with fresh, product, with fresh products. Agro-tourism agro is also an evolving pillar under the overall thrust of the industry. We are making significant investments in the development of geothermal energy, not only as a clean source of energy that enhances our appeal as a nature island, but it offers more affording, affordable energy and therefore will lower operation costs for our hotels and guest houses. We have been working on air, air access. This continues to bear fruit with Caribbean Airlines now offering direct flights from Barbados and Trinidad and Trinidad, and American Airlines recent announcement or direct flight from Miami. Yes. Mr. Speaker, our unique product offering is sought after by travelers from all over the world. Government's investment in the construction of an international airport will bring the world within closer reach to all that Dominica has to offer and will have significant positive benefits for all our tourism stakeholders. Mr. Speaker, agriculture remains a top priority for this government. Budgetary allocation of $31.9 million has been provided during this fiscal year for initiatives 
which will advance the continued expansion of the agricultural sector. The development of banana and planting, vegetable and livestock will continue, as well as the modernization of processing of traditional crops, such as cassava, toloma, bay leaf, herbs and spices, and tree crop expansion will, all, will also take place. The Agricultural Resilience Program will also continue with the, with the distribution of seedlings, fertilizers, and inputs to farms. In this financial year, we will begin the implementation of the livestock and infrastructure components of the Agricultural Resilience Program um, and monetize tools and equipment to the tune of $5 million will be distributed to farmers. In addition, 250 livestock farmers will receive assistance in the form of materials valued at $3.1 million to facilitate construction of climate resilience, resilient animal housing. Also, over 50 fisher folks will receive newly constructed fishing boats. Renovation works will continue at the Central Livestock Farm at Londonderry at the cost of $1.2 million. The five regional offices in the Northeast, East, Central, South, and Southeast will be refurbished to support the Division of Agriculture in the delivery of essential services to our farmers. We'll also rehabilitate three propagation centers in Londonderry, Woodfordville, and Lapland to facilitate the availability of planting material for restoration of tree crops, root crops, and perennials. The construction of the agricultural, agricultural science complex building at one mile was delayed due to COVID-19 restrictions. However, this project to be undertaken by the government with the valuable support of the government of the People's Republic of China will commence in January 2022. This important complex will house a trading center tissue culture lab, and accommodation for the experts. Mr. Speaker, this fiscal year, we will see the total rehabilitation of the Rose of Fisheries Complex and restoration works at the Marigot Fisheries Facility post-Hurricane Maria damage with grant funding from the government of Japan. <laughs> this project was similarly delayed by COVID-19, Mr. Speaker. On May 24th, 20, 2021, however, we signed a contract for Japanese firm to undertake these two projects. Work is scheduled to commence on July 31, 2021. This will enhance the quality and safety of the handling of fish products for, con for customers. This project is valued at approximately $27 million. $10.7 million of that amount is expected to be spent during this fiscal year. We thank the government of Japan for partnering with the government of Dominica on this very important project. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, over the years, we have achieved a reasonable level of success in agricultural production. However, with the advent of the international airport and in our quest to expand and modernize the agricultural sector, there is a need to rationalize all existing agricultural systems and services being provided by the government. To this end, we have decided to establish an Agricultural Development Authority with a focused mandate of linking production to market through research and development. There have been concerns expressed about the need to have better coordination between the factors of production and marketing. The government is of the view that it is in the interest of our farmers to create a single entity to coordinate all aspects of production and marketing. In that regard, we are proceeding with the establishment of an authority that will focus on linking products to markets. We anticipate that this mandate will be carried out with a mix of the following. Marketing and market access for specified crops, production, technology introduction and, ad and adaptation, financing to support the commercialization of agricultural production and agribusiness, plant propagation, and research and development. We intend to consult with stakeholders on this process. It is expected, Mr. Speaker, that the governance structure of such an authority 
will be under the direction of the Minister of Agriculture and will comprise of both public and private sector interests. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, further to the decision taken by the government in respect to cannabis in last year's budget, government is now ready to explore all the possibilities, all the possibilities, all the possibilities that investments in cannabis offers, particularly the value-added component of cannabis, such as the production of marijuana oils, supplements, and other products that the global market, the global market demands. The point is, Mr. Speaker, many of our citizens who have been suffering from cancer have proclaimed that the marina oil is a very important part of the treatment. And we do not think that our people who are suffering and in need and need this to cushion their pain should have to procure these oils in a clandestine manner. We will therefore put in place the necessary structure to allow for the production and procurement of these oils in a tra in transparently and also legally for those who need it. <laughs> on a broader scale, bold and decisive action on Dominica's involvement in the cannabis industry is needed. In that regard, a national task force has been established by the cabinet to give focused attention to this important area, which can pave the way for multiple new jobs and be an important revenue earner. So we look forward to the work of the task force, Mr. Speaker. But as we always say, we are approaching this in a responsible manner, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, there can be no argument in this country that this government has spent substantial sums of money in improving roads in Dominica. This includes our primary, secondary, and even village roads. The significant improvements that we have made have been affected by disasters. But this has not caused us to waver because we have always held the belief that in order to enhance commerce, tourism, and trade, the country must have good road infrastructure. With this in mind, $63.8 million of the budget has been allocated to the enhancement of our road infrastructure. Work on the $126 million East Coast Road Project will continue during this fiscal year. This project includes the road realignment and resurfacing, new drainage systems, and the construction of several new bridges. This project is progressing satisfactorily. 79 individuals are currently employed on this project, and we expect this number to increase as work continues. Mr. Speaker, earlier this month, government signed a contract valued at $11.6 million for the construction of the first section of the Layu Valley Road. That is from, Hills, from the Hillsborough Bridge to the York Valley Bridge. Consistent with our resilience policy, this project would include a full realignment of that section of the road away from the river. It, is, it, it will comprise retaining walls where required for additional protection to mitigate against flood risk, Work will commence on August, by August 2021, Mr. Speaker. Designs for the second phase, that is from the Layu Valley Bridge, sorry, it's from the York Valley Bridge to Sultan, Junction in Sultan, have been completed and are being reviewed. Work on this section is expected to begin before the completion of the first section, which I spoke about, and no later than fiscal year 2022, 2023. The full restoration of this major road artery will greatly facilitate the farmers in the Layu area, service providers in the tourism industry, and residents of the west, north, and east coast of Dominica. To complement the Layu Valley Road project, work will continue on the restoration of the Hillsborough East Bridge, which was damaged during the passage of Hurricane Maria. The cost of this project is $8.9 million. Mr. Speaker, <coughs> Roseau, our capital city, is a commercial heartbeat of this country. Therefore, whatever happens in the city 
impacts the entire country. The vision of this Dominican Labour Party administration is to transform Roseau into a modern, green, dynamic, resilient city. As you can see, Mr. Speaker, the transformation has already begun. We have brought excitement to Roseau, particularly with the development of the new Riverside Riverbank Promenade and the commissioning of the Windsor Park Forecourt Multipurpose Hardcourts Facility. All of these have facilitated the creation and expansion of businesses, increased activity, and have brought new life to the city. Let us not forget that all of this began with significant investments in roads and bridges, which has received which has relieved traffic congestion to and through the city. To date, this government has constructed three new bridges, the West Bridge, the Dominica China Friendship Bridge, and the Goodwill Link Road Bridge. We also reinstated and upgraded the East Hidal Black Bridge. This government also constructed the Rosa to Goodwill Link Road and the Stadium Bypass, as well as the river defense walls along the greater part of the river bank. Mr. Speaker, the Rosa Enhancement Project will continue this year with the reconstruction and enhancement of the Great Judge Street and Independence Street. This will include an improved drainage system, new road surface, pedestrian-friendly sidewalks, which importantly will cater to people with disabilities, covered drains, enhanced lighting, and the placement of utility lines on the ground. Immediately thereafter, we will begin similar activities on the King George the Fifth Street, um, Mr. Speaker. There is no doubt that these investments will increase the value of properties in Rosa. We have seen the construction of a number of new buildings in the city over the past 10 years. We hope to see this trend continue with the replacement of current abandoned properties with brand new structures. I therefore urge businesses and private residents to join in and upgrade their properties. Because I tell you, a tax on these abandoned properties is coming. <laughs> Meanwhile, Mr. Speaker, the Riverbank Resilient Housing Apartments opposite the grammar school are nearing completion and will provide shelter to 66 families and commercial spaces for eight business owners. Additional apartments will be constructed on River Street and in Pound, as the government believes that we need to maintain our city's unique feature of being a residential city. During this fiscal financial year, we will also construct a new ferry terminal on the Dame Eugene Charles Boulevard, which will include shopping, entertainment, and hospitality facilities geared towards increasing visitor spend and bringing additional income to our people. In addition, Mr. Speaker, we will build a commercial building which will accommodate a movie theater built for purpose and a mini mall in an effort to enhance attractions, not only for our citizens, but visitors as well. It is not the intention, Mr. Speaker, of the government to manage these facilities. We're building this infrastructure to pass them to the private citizens so they can generate wealth for themselves and economic activity. The old market, will also be transformed into a safe, safe in nature mini cruise village, while at the same time maintaining its historical value, significance, and stature. The transformation of the old market will enhance the business opportunities for the existing vendors, in addition to opportunities for new entrants. And this is gonna be a wonderful project, Mr. Speaker. Improving it, but maintaining its historical significance and stature. Mr. Speaker, I can say to the people of Rosa and the people of Dominica that the future is bright for the city and the people of Rosa as we continue to transform and enhance the city and the lives of the people. Mr. Speaker, government is making every effort to commence the rehabilitation of the, road of the Lubia to Bacatel Road during this fiscal year. This road is to be financed by a grant from the government of the United Kingdom. A first set of designs was completed in calendar year 2020. However, the cost of rehabilitation based on these designs far exceeded the grant 
and the road had to be redesigned and broken up into phases. The geotechnical investigations are ongoing that, that are ongoing for the project from Lube to Granby and advertisements for pre-qualification of contractors have been published. We are aware of the major vulnerability along this road. We are very concerned that it has not yet started. Notwithstanding our best efforts to accelerate this project, we have encountered several challenges, many beyond the control of this government. We thank the residents of the South for their patience and support as we look forward to the commencement of this project no later than the fourth quarter of this fiscal year. And I can, and I can tell the residents down there, both Dr. Daru and um, Comrade Ed Ridge, the member of Granby, continuously demand answers and responses and updates on this project and so on. So I'm happy that we're making progress and very soon we will see work started on this. The International Airport, Mr. Speaker. The International Airport. The International Airport, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the most impactful, I see, I see Senator Sanford smiling excited and so on. Thank you very much. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the most impactful public sector investment project to be taken in the history of this country is the International Airport. This priority project has already begun. We're spending programmed for this year at $75 million. On June 9, 2021, this government set into motion the fulfillment of a promise made to the people of this beloved country by the Dominican Labor Party. Government has acquired all of the lands required for the airport, and impacted residents are being relocated. The lab for materials testing for the airport is now 70% complete. Mr. Speaker, 30 homes are currently under construction at the Joe Burton for those who, who opted for homes instead of cash payments. These homes will be built to our established, resilient standards. Joe Burton is buzzing with activity as we speak. Six contractors are on site, and over 100 people are employed. We expect these homes to be completed by the end of September this year. This new housing development has a total of 140 residential lots situated on 34 acres, which provides a great opportunity for other potential homeowners to own a piece of Wesley. The additional lots will, be, will soon be available for sale as part of our strategy for community expansion. Mr. Speaker, the International Airport will facilitate the physical and economic transformation of this country in a manner never seen before. It will catalyze sustainable growth and development, engendering tremendous economic gains through its direct impact, starting in the Wesley Woodford Hill Palm Tree area, then spreading to all parts of Dominica and touching Dominicans at home and abroad. The presence of an international airport will position Dominica to expand our exports. Farmers will be able to expand more produce and receive higher margins, and there will be greater opportunities for value-added agricultural products. It will be the lever for cottage industry exporters and manufacturers to the Dominican diaspora and to regional and international markets. That is why, Mr. Speaker, this visionary government has set aside 150 acres of land to be used for agriculture. Wesley, Wesley Woodford Hill Palm Tree is known as one of the major bread baskets of Dominica. And we are ensuring that agricultural production not only continues, but will be expanded to respond to the opportunities created as a result of the International Airport. Dominica's International Airport will be one of the most attractive airports in the region. There will be four jet bridges, state-of-the-art baggage sorting and scanning systems, faster immigration processing, and the use of technology to ensure passengers receive a world-class experience. This will include, this will include self checks, self-checking kiosks, VIP and airport executive lounges, 
to facilitate an, incre an increase in the number of business visitors and tourists to our country. Mr. Speaker, people all over the world are keen to visit our country. Dominicans, in, in with its abundance of natural attraction is, and its friendly people, safety, stable government, health place, healthy place to live, and its recently constructed five-star hotels has become one of the most sought-after destinations. The problem has been access to a beautiful country. That is why we in this government will not rest until we build the International Gate. Getting to Dominica can be costly. It is also a grave inconvenience given the number of stops to get here. Some have had to overnight. Some have had to spend long transit times just trying to connect, not forgetting the limited flight options. Our international airport will fix this, Mr. Speaker. People want to come to Dominica. Dominicans in the diaspora want to come to Dominica. Dominicans want weekend trips. And by the grace of God, this Labour Party government will build the international airport. We have embarked on a marketing campaign internationally, not only promoting Dominica, but also letting the world know that in just a few years, Dominica will have a state-of-the-art modern international airport capable of accommodating long-haul aircrafts from major capitals in Europe, North America, and the rest of the world. Every Dominican will be proud of this international airport, including, Mr. Speaker, those who do not support the government. Yes. It will help secure all of the investments that we have made and we are making in tourism, in agriculture, and in improving the environment for doing business in Dominica. And I want to say to the citizens of this country, Mr. Speaker, that this international airport is being built solely with funds from the Citizenship by Investment Program, and therefore will place absolutely no tax or debt burden on the people of Dominica or generations yet born. And this is extraordinary, Mr. Speaker. This is extraordinary. And so on behalf of the government and all Dominicans, I extend our thanks to the people of Wesley, Woodfordale, and Palm Tree for their continued cooperation and support and for their contribution to national development. We also express our gratitude to Montreal Management Consultants for partnering with the government and people of Dominica to develop this dream project. I also take this opportunity to thank the many public officers who are working tirelessly to ensure that this project is a success. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the latest announcement by American Airlines in the last few days that they will now commence direct commercial flights from Miami to Dominica has been met with great joy and excitement. Yeah. This is a major achievement, particularly during the COVID-19 pandemic. At a time when airlines are cutting back on flights, this is a vote of confidence in our destination by American airlines. Yeah, this is as a result of the hard work that your government has been doing to market and prepare this country, and the significant investments that we have made in improving our infrastructure and our hotel offerings. The direct flight from Miami to Dominica will begin on December 8th, 2021. <laughs> Members of this Honorable House, this is just the beginning. The future of Dominica is bright. The future is extremely bright for the children of Dominica. Mr. Speaker, I have presented the principal features of the capital estimates for the, for the new financial year including a portfolio of planned capital investments in fiscal year 2021-2022, which will facilitate the transformation of Dominica. We are creating Dynamic Dominica, 
a prosperous, resilient, peaceful, secure, and just society, a stable, sustainable economy, and a protected environment. This government will continue to work towards this goal. I will now shift my focus to the lives and livelihoods of our people. Mr. Speaker, an improved standard of health care remains one of this government's top priorities. Focus will continue on improved access to and the delivery of quality public health services with a total allocation of $32 million in the PSIP. Work on the final phase of the Dominical China Friendship Hospital is ongoing. When completed, the Dominical China Friendship Hospital will offer a wider range of medical services, delivering improved standards under the new Dominical Hospital Authority, which is expected to commence operations in August 1, 2021. Mr. Speaker, we expect that with this new authority, there will be a greater accountability and efficiency, which will result in better patient care. The new Marigold Hospital, in which we have invested approximately $50 million, is 98% complete and will be commissioned this year. This, this new hospital will comprise 38 beds, an ICU, two isolation rooms, a two-room operating theater, and a four-bed recovery room. These are among many of the features which will allow for a significant expansion in the services that will be offered to the people of the Marigot Health District. And very soon, especially those who need to be dialyzed, you will no longer have to travel to Roseau to get dialysis treatment. You will get it at the Marigot Hospital. Primary health care has no doubt received a significant boost with the completion of our 12 new health and wellness centers, which will enhance the delivery of services to citizens and residents. This financial year, we will witness the construction of three additional health and wellness centers in the city of Roseau, St. Joseph, and Savon Pai. And for the people of St. Joseph, I want to say to you that the time of us crossing or arriving to go to the health center is coming to an end in St. Joseph, the construction of the health center. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, this Labour Party-led government will continue its commitment to improving the living and housing standards of our people. And with this, $57 million has been allocated to the Ministry of Housing. During this fiscal year, government intends to build a total of 785 new homes for people. In addition, we will also invest in the Home Renovation and Sanitation Program. Funds for the construction of those homes will, be, will come from a loan contracted from the World Bank, grants from the European Union, and the Citizenship by Investment Program. The Housing Recovery Project, which will benefit 450 recipients of new homes, will be allocated $6 million. The, the Home Renovation and Sanitation Project will also continue into the fiscal year at a cost of $4 million. While under the Modern Resilient Housing Project, 235 new homes are expected to be completed within the next, within the next 12 months. Another rev avenue employed to address the housing need has been the Sustainable Housing Solutions option. This modality utilizes a precast concrete system to construct homes. To date, quite a few families, 92 families, have benefited. Considering our ambitious efforts to provide housing to our vulnerable people, this option reduces the time for construction of units. I have been advised, Mr. Speaker, that the, that the, that, that the precast plant here in Dominica is now complete and will substantially increase the number and speed of, at which we build homes under this particular project. A minimum, of, a minimum of 50 homes will be targeted for this fiscal year at an estimate cost of $2 million. Mr. Speaker, the economic and social advancement of our indigenous people continues to be a priority for my government. Over the years, we have implemented a number of initiatives aimed at improving living standards of the Carnegie people in the areas of housing, employment, health, education, and small business, to name a few. In this fiscal year, this work will continue. We know, Mr. Speaker, that our Canada people have had severe housing challenges posed by communal land ownership. 
This government proposes to continue to provide support to the Carnegie people through a number of avenues. We have created funding from the European Union to the Carnegie Territory. Directed, we have directed funding from the European Union to the Carnegie Territory to construct 50 resilient homes. A total of $10.3 million will be invested in this project, $4.6 million of which will be disbursed during this fiscal year. We wish to thank the European Union for its extraordinary partnership with Dominica as it continues to support our development efforts. Mr. Speaker, we also recognize how difficult it is for the Carnegie people to procure loans from the financial institutions for investments, given the current legal arrangements, which not permit them to obtain titles to the lands within the territory. In this fiscal year, we have allocated an initial amount of $800,000 towards the establishment of the Kalanago Development Fund. The main objective of the fund is to provide an avenue for the people of the Kalanago Territory to access financing for the establishment of small businesses, the construction and renovation of homes and other ventures. It is government's intention to further capitalize this fund and then allow it to operate as a revolving fund. This fund is expected to be an important source of funding for the Carnegie people to access financing to improve their social and economic circumstances. This will be a novel approach to making funding available to the Carnegie people who have had challenges in providing the title security which banks and credit unions traditionally request as security for loans. Mr. Speaker, one of the conditions for accessing these loans will be that the funds must be spent on businesses or homes being established or constructed in the Kalanago territory, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, over the years, we have placed emphasis on promoting a culture of entrepreneurship. This government believes that enterprise development is key to long-term economic growth. An amount of $33 million is being made available to the aid bank for unlending at, concession, at concessional rates of 3.5% for the recovery and development of micro, small, and medium enterprises. $33 million are monies that we have deliberately decided to invest in small, micro, and medium-sized enterprises. And this is in order to encourage and support the startup of additional small businesses Government has been providing concessions to those who apply through the investment, Invest Dominica Authority. These concessions include the waiver of import duty on plant and equipment, and for new businesses, the waiver of that as well. In addition, as has been mentioned, last month government implemented a grant program for the Ministry of Tourism, targeting small agro-processors, manufacturers, and creative industries. This support will continue during this fiscal year. Mr. Speaker, government met with several groups of small business owners as part of our pre-budget consultation process. One of the main requests coming from these meetings was for government to provide technical support to them as they move to develop and expand their businesses. As a result, government has decided to upgrade the small business unit into a one-stop shop for small businesses and Dominica. The unit will be refocused to provide additional technical assistance support in the form of training, mentoring small businesses on budgeting, business management, development of business and marketing plans, and incorporating technology into their businesses. The unit will also assist small businesses to expedite processes within the public service. In addition, Mr. Speaker, Small businesses who are making additional investments and require concessions under the Fiscal Incentives Act will also be able to apply through the Small Business Unit. We are well aware of the potential contribution for growth of these small businesses and the contribution to household income and the economy. Therefore, we continue to create the enabling environment to facilitate the expansion of small business or the small business sector. We are also increasing the marketing of Dominica's products 
and improving national infrastructure. It is absolutely important that we strengthen our micro, small, and medium-sized businesses subsector in order for them to take advantage of the added opportunities that the International Airport will bring. Mr. Speaker, the Ministry of Education proved to be responsive, innovative, and, ad and adaptable to the changing environment brought on by COVID-19 pandemic. Government's continued support of systems and initiatives in the education sector has ensured that learning continues during these challenging times. And I want to recognize the leadership and the guidance of our Minister for Education, Honorable Alfred. This year, government will continue to upgrade our country's educational institutions to ensure they facilitate student learning. In this process, we are also seeking to ensure that programs of study are aligned with the needs of the economy, promote green technology, and meet the prerequisites of national development and growth. Construction of a new Mao Primary School with funding from CBI resources and rehabilitation of Dalis, Monjon, Grand Bay, and Will Strasmore Stevens Primary Schools will continue during this fiscal year with funding from the Government of Canada. Meanwhile, the construction of six schools to be funded by the People's Republic of China is scheduled to begin during the third quarter of this fiscal year. Under this project, primary schools will be constructed at Kalibishi, Bellevue Chopin, Thibault, Tetmon, and Sinepo, along with the Goodwill Secondary School. In addition, funds have, have been allocated in this year's budget for the improvement and maintenance of several schools. Mr. Speaker, we remain committed to the Dominican State College. This is evidenced by the significant investments we have made in the institution through infrastructure development over the years. This fiscal year, we have allocated an additional funding of $2.5 million to continue critical repairs to the facilities. In this fiscal year, we will also see the commencement of my alma mater, the construction, Mr. Speaker, of the Dominica Grammar School. And I think all former students and current students and future students at the grammar school will be very proud of the edifice that we construct for the grammar school, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, education for development and education for the enabling of dynamic Dominica are our priority in this government. As part of our efforts to achieve greater resilience, ensure the safety of our citizens in the event of a disaster, and to allow us to return to normalcy faster post-event, investments have been made to increase the capacity of the Office of Disaster Management, ODM. in the construction of regional shelters and, are, and uh, that are hurricane and earthquake resistant. Regional hurricane shelters are being built in Jimmet and Casabruz at a total cost of $32 million and are nearing completion. Designs are also being finalized for hurricane shelter to serve the Canalago Territory and Atkinson. The Canalago Shelter will cost some EC $4.1 million. Funding for the shelters is being provided by the European Union, and we express our thanks for the invaluable contribution to our resilience efforts. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, ensuring a safe environment for the vulnerable, particularly the elderly and our children, remains prominent on, this agenda, on the agenda of this government. In addition to providing economic support, this government has implemented several programs, including the Yes We Care and Chances. The success of these programs is quite visible. However, notwithstanding our efforts, there are still too many incidents of the abuse and neglect of the elderly, the children, and this cannot be tolerated in our society. This year, Mr. Speaker, government will take to the parliament the Children Care and, Adop and Adoption Bill. The bill, along with its regulations, will give the court greater latitude in the overall care and protection of our children. Also, also during this fiscal year, government will restructure the welfare division to better respond to present-day challenges. This will include, include the engagement of, a, of additional child protection officers 
a clinical psychologist, and another counselor in a child abuse unit. This increase in staff, we hope, will help curb and indeed eliminate the incidence of abuse of our children. We recognize, Mr. Speaker, this is a societal problem and it's going to require a societal response. And we hope that the additional resources will help the ministry uh, bring an end to child abuse in our country. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, in fulfilling a promise given to the public service, government engaged CARICAD during the last fiscal year to work on the reclassification and modernization of the public service. This work has been carried out in five phases and, it will, and will include extensive consultations with governmental and non-governmental stakeholders. This exercise is currently on schedule and a final report is expected to be delivered to government no later than November 30, 2021. We have already received and provided feedback on a report from CARICAD on its assessment of the current salary uh, allowances. We anticipate that the reclassification will result in changes to the public service pay scale and salary increases for various positions within the public service. Mr. Speaker, in addition, the restructuring process at the government secondary schools has started. This was a promise made in my 2019-2020 budget address. Since then, in keeping with commitments made to our public officers, we have also upgraded the pay scale of principals of secondary schools and created several new positions as follows. 15 deputy principal positions, Mr. Speaker. Seven, seven assistant deputy principals. Eight heads of department. Eight, sorry, 87 heads of department. 87 heads of department. 28 senior graduate teachers, 70 senior qualified teachers, and 16 school counselors for the secondary schools. <laughs> this has resulted in a total of 223 new positions at our secondary schools, which is a significant investment in our teachers and our secondary schools in Dominica, Mr. Speaker. This new structure will come into effect from September 1, 2021, and will cost the government an additional $1.3 million annually. The next step, Mr. Speaker, will be the complete review of the structure of the primary school level in Dominica. A similar review is also being undertaken for the nursing service in our country, Mr. Speaker. So we're making progress where this is a concern, step by step to the benefit not only of the teachers, but very importantly, the students, Mr. Speaker, because we have schools because we have students. And whatever we do must benefit the students as well. And we believe that this will benefit. And this has been a, a mantra of mine for many years, Mr. Speaker, and I'm happy that we're implementing it. And in addition to the restructuring and modernization of the public service, Funds have been set aside in this year's recurrent and capital estimates to improve the physical working conditions in a number of public facilities, including government headquarters, schools, the customs department, and fire and police stations. And I'm saying to, to the CPO and to the public servants who work at the government headquarters, the old building, that we will, we will spend about $900,000, Mr. Speaker, just to replace the toilets and new tiling and new plumbing in all of the floors there too. To, because I went in there and you know, there's no way we should be allowing people to use this. Um, so this year it will come to an end. Mr. Speaker, earlier in this calendar year, the government completed very cordial and successful negotiations with all the public service unions. We agreed on a number of matters to benefit public officers. Government has kept its commitments based on the agreed schedule. Further, provisions have been made in the budget for all of the other matters to be implemented during this fiscal year, including payments of $800,000 towards a disaster emergency fund, which was agreed with the unions. That fund is intended to support public officers 
following major loss. Government has committed to replenishing that fund on an annual basis if required. So this is good news again for public officers. In this <laughs> Government recognizes that we have to facilitate our public officers and private sector employees, people in the diaspora and young professionals to meet their housing needs. We have started therefore preparatory work, including the identification of lands at one, which will serve as a housing development area. We have appointed a committee to guide the process and we expect that once there is, a, there is broad agreement with the designs, work should commence by the fourth quarter of this fiscal year. An amount of $2 million has been allocated in this year's budget for the commencement of this project title, Future Housing Development Program. And how this is work with this work, Mr. Speaker, will use the CBI funds to build this new housing development, targeting public officers and those employed in the private sector and those in the diaspora, and young professionals, and the government will assign some of those homes to the government housing loan board. And those homes will be sold to a public officer at cost, with maybe a zero or one percent interest rate on these loans. And to the private sector and participating financial institutions, you will also get these homes sold to you at cost, Mr. Speaker, making the ability of Dominicans to access homes much more affordable for them. And this is the commitment to the government that will be building this new development. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, our social and economic su support for the vulnerable, including the elderly, single mothers, and the less privileged is well known. This government continues to put safety nets in place to protect the nation's most vulnerable citizens. It is for this reason, Mr. Speaker, that the government will continue funding all the social support programs which make a difference in the lives of those who most need help. Elaborating on this film, it is important that employees, Mr. Speaker, get a fair day's pay for a fair day's work in respect to minimum wage. And in that regard, an advisory board was appointed in 2019 to review and advise on the, on the minimum wage of Dominica. After much consultation and deliberation, the committee submitted its report. Government also held discussions with the International Labour Organization. Following this exercise, government took a decision to increase the minimum wage in Dominica. In addition, we have expanded the categories of workers to provide protection to a greater number of our more vulnerable workers. The proposed increase in the minimum wage will take effect from September 1, 2021. The wage increase is intended to ensure that all citizens can cope with the difficult circumstances of the current times and maintain themselves and their families to an acceptable level. Mr. Speaker, it is important for us as a society, indeed for all of us, to value everyone's contribution to the success of our businesses. And oftentimes, the people who make the greatest contribution to the success of our businesses are the lower paid people. That is why it is incumbent on this government and indeed the parliament to look out for the most vulnerable amongst us. I know, Mr. Speaker, I know that some have raised concern about the timing of the introduction of this new measure. But the reality is, the reality is that, Mr. Speaker, the lower paid people cannot delay their meals. Yep. COVID may be with us for a while, and we, can't, we cannot continue to defer this measure. In any event, based on the information received from the private sector during the review, most businesses were already paying, as they said in their own submission, above the current minimum wage. So I think it's a win-win for everybody, and we need to press on with this. Mr. Speaker, in my budget address in 2016, I announced that the non-contributory pension payable to persons over the age of 70 years, who were not otherwise in receipt of a pension, would increase to $300 monthly. 
At the time, I challenged Dominican Social Security to have its minimum pension also set at the same amount. The DSS increased its minimum pension to $300 monthly as of 1st September 2016. And as a result, over 1,000 DSS pensioners who were in receipt of pensions lower than $300 monthly were brought up to that minimum. These pensions are also subject to triennial inflammatory increases. The DSS had not, however, applied that minimum to persons who, for reasons of ill health, had to quit employment and if satisfying the qualifying conditions, receive an invalidity pension. Such persons, if they qualify at the minimum, are still in receipt of $202 monthly. And that came to my attention by my interaction with the people. A lady came to me and said she's only getting $202 a month from Social Security. I said, no, you should be getting $300. And it's only then she told me that she's getting invalidity pension. And I recognized that that increase to $300 didn't apply to them. And so, Mr. Speaker, with effect from August 1, 2021, the minimum invalidity pension paid by DSS will now be $303 a month. Just for, you, just for you to know, I have September 1 in my speech, but I am putting it as October, August 1, Mr. Speaker, advancing by one month. So it's August 1, 2021. Mr. Speaker, over the years, this government has taken a number of bold and sound decisions to secure the future of nationals under the Social Security, particularly when they are no longer able to work and has implemented the reforms recommended by the actuary to ensure that the program remains sustainable. Notwithstanding, as Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, as you know, I interface with thousands of Dominicans on an annual basis, and some have raised concern about the adequacy of your pension. As Minister responsible for DSS, I will engage with the Board of Directors to review the manner in which incremental increases are awarded to pensioners. It has also been brought to my attention, Mr. Speaker, that when employers do not make the payments to Social Security on behalf of the employer, employees, this reduces the pension. I would therefore like to call on these employers to ensure that they meet the obligations to DSS on behalf of the employees. This will secure their future. This will secure future payments to pensioners and add to their quality of life in the twilight years. It's important for us to pay attention to this. Mr. Speaker, in 2012, government signed onto the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And then in, 2000, in December 2019, we dedicated a special ministerial portfolio to give more prominent attention to this group. We are committed to respecting the rights and inherent dignity of this vulnerable group among us. We are therefore taking the important step of putting a commission in place to look after the interests of persons living with disabilities. The commission, the commission will also will advise the government on the policies, programs, and activities to be implemented in order to promote and ensure the quality, equal opportunity, equal employment, and enjoyment of human rights and fundamental freedoms of individuals living with disabilities. It will comprise individuals with disabilities, as well as representatives of care institutions, non-government organizations, and the private and public sector. In Dynamic Dominica, all will live with dignity, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, to, com to complement the investments that we are making in the development of sporting facilities, Government will expand the sports division with the appointment of coaches who will serve as mentors and coaching assistants to community-based clubs. This is in addition to the support which is currently being provided by the sports officers. Further, to augment our thrust in sports 
for recreation and revenue generation. Government will establish a National Sports Council. This proposal has received the full support of the National Sports Associations on Island. It is, it is anticipated that when established, the Council will spearhead the development of a national sports policy. One of the tasks that we expect the Council to oversee is the establishment by government of a national sports trust fund, which will be capitalized with revenues from the CBI program, with the hope that private sector entities will also contribute. One of the objectives of the fund will be to better facilitate local sports clubs and athletes to participate in regional and international sporting tournaments and events. All things considered, I would like for the National Sports Council to be fully operational by January 2022. Sports for recreation, health and revenue are part of the social and economic features of Dynamic Dominic. Mr. Speaker, in last year's budget, this government allocated funds to provide grants of $10,000 each to young first-time home builders or purchasers. As of June 30, 2021, 114 applications were approved and an amount of $1.1 million have been paid to beneficiaries for purchase of building materials, land transfer fees and services such as utilities and labor costs. This is yet another innovative measure by this government, which has been well received by the beneficiaries and which has encouraged and supported the development of our young people. As a result, Mr. Speaker, this fiscal year, we have allocated another $1 million to continue this program. So the program for this grant housing grant for people 40 years and younger will continue in this fiscal year, Mr. Speaker. Extension in the reduction of land transfer fees. Mr. Speaker, during my presentation of last year's budget, I announced a temporary reduction in land transfer fees to allow potential beneficiaries an opportunity to formally register and obtain certificates of title for their lands. To facilitate this measure, Parliament approved of amendments to the relevant legislation in October 2020, which resulted in the application of the following fees on the transfer or purchase of land with effect from September 1, 2020. Stamp duty, 2%, judicial fee, 1%, assurance fund, 1%, fees to lawyers, a maximum of 2.5%. Mr. Speaker, from all indications, Dominicans have welcomed and embraced the opportunity to formalize the ownership of the lands. The number of requests for certificate of titles, as I said earlier, Mr. Speaker, in the fiscal year on the just passed, they exceeded, was exceeded by 71%, Mr. Speaker. Requests for certificate of titles exceeded previously by 71%. Mr. Speaker, the government recognizes that this measure has had tremendous positive impact. This is an important measure to facilitate investments in home and property ownership and the acquisition of assets by our citizens and an important tool for economic advancement. In view of the positive benefits to our citizens and the numerous calls we have received and the desire expressed by people to see this measure extended, the government has decided to further extend this measure for one more year. This, this means, Mr. Speaker, that the current transfer fees of 6.5% to be paid by buyers on a transfer of land or property will apply until October 31, 2022. This will translate, Mr. Speaker, in millions of dollars, in millions of dollars remaining in people's pockets, Mr. Speaker. Millions. Mr. Speaker, the poultry farmers of Dominica have been working very hard to ensure that Dominica can sustain itself the supply of eggs and chicken. 
One of the many challenges in, is the ability to source chicks. They have had to produce, to procure, sorry, and transport chicks from other countries, which have proved to be at times difficult and costly. Poultry farmers, poultry farming is a great industry in Dominica. We are well on our way to becoming self-sufficient with the supply of whole chicken. As a government must continue to support these farmers and create the environment to increase production where possible. With this in mind, I am happy to announce the exemption of VAT on hatching eggs classified on the customs tariff heading HS 0407.10 with effect from August 1, 2021. This will encourage existing farmers and other interested individuals to set up hatcheries to supply chicks. Therefore, Mr. Speaker, instead of importing day-old chicks, we will be importing fertilized eggs and they will be hatched in Dominica, which will result in reduced costs to the farmers and more competitive prices of chicken and eggs on the local market. Of course, Mr. Speaker, increased job opportunities will also be created with the operation of these hatcheries. Mr. Speaker, this government has an impeccable reputation for providing income tax relief to its people. When we came into office, we increased the personal allowance from $12,000 per month per year to $30,000 per year, resulting in thousands of people not having to pay income tax. The income tax rates were 20%, 30% and 40%. These were reduced to 15%, 25%, and 35%. A deduction was introduced for interest paid on student loans for the first time in 2002. Prior to 2002, Mr. Speaker, everybody paid their interest with no deductions on student loans. Mortgage interest deductions moved from $12,000 to $30,000 on the individual's primary residence and thereafter be allowed a deduction for interest paid on a second home. Reduced the tax on net residential rent income for individuals in the 35% and 25% brackets down to 20% while the rate remained unchanged for those in the 20% brackets. Mr. Speaker, all of these tax measures have resulted in millions of dollars remaining in the pockets of Dominicans. This year, we are going a step further. First, with the complete, with the removal of income tax on income earned from residential rent. So from henceforth, Mr. Speaker, there'll be no taxes on residential rent in Dominica. The 20%, the 15% will be no more. Because, Mr. Speaker, we are aware that many of these rental properties are owned by salaried workers and pensioners who have paid or are already paying their fair share of income tax. They have taken their after-tax income and have invested in these properties to augment their income and pensions. This government would like to further encourage these types of investments as they benefit not only the landlords, but the country by, by, the country by increasing construction activity, assisting with housing our people, increasing the room stock available to visitors, creating short-term and long-term employment, and as a result, contribute to the growth and development of our country. <laughs> Therefore, Mr. Speaker, with effect from income year 2021, that is, this year, income tax on res residential rent income is exempt in the Commonwealth of Dominica. Yeah. In 2002, Mr. Speaker, this government introduced a measure which allows students or their parents to claim an annual income tax deduction for interest paid on student loans at a maximum of $5,000 per student. Mr. Speaker, we are aware that the cost of education has increased significantly since this measure was first introduced. To further invest in our students and foster education and training, 
government has decided to allow students or their parents to claim all of the interest paid on their student loans each year. So every single cent a parent or a student pays on the student loan, they can claim it, Mr. Speaker. This measure will take effect from January 2022 to coincide with the incoming, uh, with, with, the, with the current income here, Mr. Speaker. Further, Mr. Speaker, this government has already declared that we must build a resilient Dominic. This entails building resilience at the individual level within families and businesses. As I've mentioned on several occasions, having the necessary financial reserves in place to assist in response and recovery, for example, savings and in insurances, is critical to achieving resilience. In order to assist individuals with their resilience plans, in particular ensuring that they are insured, government proposes to allow individuals an income tax deduction for premiums paid to insure their homes and property. The maximum deduction to be allowed is $8,000. This measure will take effect from income year 2022. Additionally, Mr. Speaker, a resilient nation requires a healthy people. Government has made significant advancements in healthcare facilities, equipment, services, and specialists at the primary, secondary, and tertiary levels. As individuals, we must invest in and prioritize our personal health. This means eating right, maintaining an exercise regime, and having adequate health insurance. Government is now offering to individuals a health insurance income tax deduction, Mr. Speaker. This deduction will be in respect of individual or family health insurance premiums paid and will take effect from income year 2022. The support for health insurance is a corollary to our efforts in quality health care and service delivery. So yet another incentive, Mr. Speaker, deduction for health insurance. Mr. Speaker, following the major losses this country suffered as a result of two devastating storms, we articulated a vision for a resilient, dynamic Dominica, advancing a new season of development of economic sustainability, improved standard of living, social justice and equality, a determined and educated people with great hope and promise. This vision presents new ideas and approaches with creative policies and innovative programs. This new season for development is here. The dynamic Dominica promise to the people of this great nation is unfolding before our very eyes. The international airport has started, and by God's grace, we will see the arrival of long haul passenger aircrafts by 2024. The development of geothermal energy is well advanced, and our geothermal plant will become active by 2023. The digitization of our economy is happening with new services coming online every few months. The transformation of our agriculture is taking place with more developments to come. We are all well aware, well on our way with the construction of modern resilient infrastructure, including new hotels, roads and bridges, and new tourism products in support of increased visitor arrivals. Businesses in particular, micro, small, and medium sized are being prepared to embrace the opportunities which are there to be had in a dynamic Dominica. Manufacturing is on the rise. Our healthcare system is being transformed to better respond to an evolving environment. And we are investing in our people and providing the enabling environment for them to succeed. Mr. Speaker, we are no longer dreaming of a dynamic Dominica. We are on our way. We are building and living in the reality of dynamic Dominica and formulating the path for its further expansion. Yes. Let us work together as a people and as a country and together share the benefits of a dynamic Dominica. It is in this spirit of shared vision and effort, common responsibility and earned results that I present the financial statement and budgetary proposals 2020-2021, 2021-2022, 2020, 
and invite Dominicans at home and abroad to step boldly with me into a dynamic Dominica. Let us hold fast to our faith in God and receive his promise that such a person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, whose leaf does not wither, and whatever they do, prosper. Amen. Amen. That is the model of prosperity in which Dynamic Dominica will be grounded, will be grounded. I thank God for Dominica. I thank God for the friends of Dominica. I thank God for the people of Dominica. I thank God, I thank God for all that he has done and continues to do for us in Dominica. To God be the glory. Great, Great things yeah. he has done for our country, Dominica. Mr. Speaker, I want to place on record my appreciation to our financial secretary, Ms. Dennis Edwards, for, for her exceptional administrative management of the Ministry of Finance and the State Finances. We do have, Mr. Speaker, conscientious and committed and dedicated Dominicans among us in this country who are making the contribution to national development. And I want to recognize them in this very special way. I also want to recognize our cabinet secretary and all of the permanent secretaries for their commitment to our country and for the dedication, all of whom are making their contribution to our development. And I want to single out the permanent secretary in the Ministry of Planning, Ms. Ms. Gloria Joseph, and the PS Office of the Prime Minister, Mrs. B.C. Henderson. I want to recognize a lady who has worked so diligently in this public service for so long, our Accountant General, Mrs. Spina, who has been, you know, the gatekeeper of the Treasury and have done so admirably um, and has done so diligently has ensured that the government did and has done everything according to the books. And that is important. And so I want to recognize her for her contribution to government. And I know she is retired, but I'm saying word to her that um, I have work for her to do. Um, so she'll hear from me. I also want to recognize the efforts of the clerk of the house and your self speaker and all your staff for your excellent work. You know, I think we have one of the best club of the house that we ever seen. Very diligent. I want to thank Mr. Speaker, my cabinet and parliamentary colleagues. I believe I am the luckiest leader of any government or party where I enjoy the absolute support of every member yeah. of the cabinet and the party. Yeah. And I can say to you, Mr. Speaker, that Dominica is in good hands with this team of men and women we have on the government side. Conscientious, committed, dedicated, caring about our country. And they have been charged with the responsibility of fulfilling the dynamic Dominica that we've spoken about. And I want to thank them. We don't always agree. Um, sometimes they prefer I'm not in cabinet sometimes. <laughs> but, um, we work together and we deliver the good to the people. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. And Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the friends of Dominic, yes. the countries which we have diplomatic relations with, the institutions, the financial institutions of this world. They have all been exceptional in supporting Dominic. And they do so not because they love Dominic more than any other country. They do so because they, have, they know that they have a government in Dominica that, that they trust. And they can trust with the monies that they provide to us yes. to pass into Dominican people. And they continue to say so, independent of us, Mr. Speaker. And so we look forward to their partnership. And to a number of my former cabinet colleagues who are still um, working diligently 
uh, you know, I don't want to call names, but the, um, all of them work in this. And very importantly, Mr. Speaker, I thank the people of Dominica for their continued trust and confidence in this government's ability to lead this country. And we will never disappoint them. Yeah, 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 yeah. And finally, I want to thank my son Malik, my son Dimitri, my daughter Isabella, and my wife Melissa for allowing me to give more of my time to this country um, in my commitment to help make a difference in the life of the entire society. Being, being the leader of a country and a party and having a family, especially young children, um, can be very difficult. But they shower me with love and, 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 and support, and which allows me the ability to do what I have to do for the greater good of a society. And so I want to thank you. Mr. Speaker, we have a country to build. We are equal to the task. And by the grace of God, our country will succeed. Thank you very much. Mr. Speaker, I move the suspension of Rule 41.6 so that the leader of the opposition can, be, can have the same time taken by the Minister of Finance in his reply to the budget. Ministers will be permitted to speak for one hour and the other members 30 minutes as provided, as provided in the rules. Mr. Speaker. Second, it has been moved and second it that the rules 45 6 and in order that is 41 6 be suspended so that uh, the uh, opposition leader is allotted the same time that the minister of finance used we record that the Prime Minister and Minister of Finance spoke from 11.29 a.m. and ended at 1.59 p.m. Two, two. Yeah, 1.59 p.m. That's 150 minutes. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. Mr. Speaker, <coughs> I rise to make my contribution towards this year's budget debate, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, let me first congratulate the Honorable Prime Minister on a job well done, Mr. Speaker. Absolutely well done. Mr. Speaker, the Honorable Prime Minister continues to show the prudent and efficient management of the resources of this country, Mr. Speaker. The prudent and efficient management of the resources of this country is absolutely important. It's a sine qua non, Mr. Speaker, for the successful implementations of our projects and programs. And that is what we have seen in this country, Mr. Speaker. I'm very happy for that. And Mr. Speaker, what brings even more joy to my heart is the implementation of 
the biggest project, the most anticipated project in the history of this country, the International Airport Project, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this year makes it 51 years since the hopes and aspirations of air access had started in Dominica, Mr. Speaker. 51 years since the Melvin Hall Airport, then now the Douglas Charles Airport, Mr. Speaker, has been established. So that is how long, 51 years, Mr. Speaker, I am 50 years, I'm not even 51 yet, since we started our hopes and dreams for enhanced air access into Dominica. Mr. Speaker, in July of 1970, Premier E. O. Libla, the father of the nation, as he then was, entered into an agreement with the Canadian government to explore the possibilities of air access into Dominica, building an international airport then, 1970, Mr. Speaker, in a place called Brandridge near Pocasset, the first attempt to establish our international airport, Mr. Speaker. But that again had to be abandoned because of excessive low cloud cover, Mr. Speaker. That initiative was abandoned. Like I said this morning when I spoke of our late Premier and then Prime Minister, the late Patrick John, he too, who succeeded Edward Oliver Libla, tried on several attempts. If we remember those of us who were old enough, remember the scheme of a man called Sidney Burnett Allen, and I wouldn't go into the history of Sidney Burnett Allen now, but for those of you all who are older than me, will know the stories associated with Sidney Burnett Allen. Also, too, you remember the controversial John Pearson and the 47 square miles of the north. All of those things are in an attempt to establish an international airport, if not the coverage. You know, we had, they had the, the Sunday Island project at the coverage. We're supposed to have a deep water harbor, a jet airstrip. All of those attempts, Mr. Speaker. Even the great Dame Eugenia Charles of blessed memory, when she came to office, Mr. Speaker, in 1980, attempted to build an international airport. Some of us remember, she, they explored the possibility of building an international airport in the Picard area with a group called the Guinness Group, Mr. Speaker. Again, in 1988, Eugenia Charles never gave up her quest to establish an international airport, and she got some help from Margaret Thatcher in the United Kingdom in England at the time, Mr. Speaker, to establish an international border. And that is where we saw this Alexander Gibbs report coming into the matrix, Mr. Speaker. And the British government sent down Sir Alexander Gibbs to Dominica to explore Dominica's possibilities, Mr. Speaker, of establishing, of establishing an international airport in Dominica. All of those attempts, Mr. Speaker, was made by successive governments to establish an international airport in Dominica. And Sir Alexander Gibbs, he came down and he did his investigations. He looked at all of the sites recommended, Mr. Speaker, and he recommended a site in Crompton Point to the Dame Mary Eugenia Charles at the time. And when she saw the site that Sir Alexander Gibbs had recommended she realized that that was in the middle of the banana production belt between Wesley and Woodford Hill, Mr. Speaker. And at that time, in 1980, Dom in 1988, Dominica was one of the leading producers of bananas in the Windward Islands. And in the height of our banana production frost, Mr. Speaker, we were generating more than $100 million in 1988 in bananas. So the Prime Minister at the time who didn't want to touch that recommendation didn't want to, 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 to interfere with the destruction of the banana belt running between Woodford Hill and Wesley. And she asked Alexander Gibbs if the possibility exists of realigning the runway. And that is how Sir Alexander Gibbs eventually came up with the Crompton Point site, Mr. Speaker, although there, that site was subject to a lot of crosswinds, Mr. Speaker. And so, Mamo, after having received, sorry, Dame Eugenia Charles, Mr. Speaker, my apologies. After having received that report, Mr. Speaker, 
went to the Americans because she was very good friends with the Americans after being a hero of the Grenada invasion, which was spoken about this morning after the Grenada revolution collapsed in 1983. Correction, it was 1982, 1983. Eugenia Charles was the chairman of the OECS, I believe, at the time, and she invited the Americans in, and that story is another story. But suffice it to say, the Americans promised to send the Army Corps of Engineers here in Dominica to start the Earth Movement Works on our international airport. And what happened, Mr. Speaker? What happened? Edison James of the United Workers' Party wrote to the Americans at the time. The letter was dated 7th of February, 1990, dissuading the Americans, telling them, do not come long to build the international airport because that will interfere with our politics. It will be seen as a cheap election gimmick, Mr. Speaker. And that is why the international airport was not established. And today, Today, Mr. Speaker, almost 30 years later, Mr. Speaker, we are still here talking about an international airport. And it is only under this government that we will have an international airport established in Dominica. Make no mistake, let us make no mistake about it, Mr. Speaker. We have the right opportunity, we have the right leader in place, Mr. Speaker, and we have the right mechanism in place for generating the resources required for the establishment of the International Airport, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, as luck would have it, because God is not a policeman, you know, Mr. Speaker. God does things in the right way for us to see his works, Mr. Speaker. And as God would have it, he allowed the United Workers Party to win the elections, Mr. Speaker, of 1995 and came to power. And although they had criticized the establishment of an international airport, and they had undermined and sabotaged the Freedom Party's attempts to establish the international airport, Mr. Speaker, we see that in the years 1995 to 2000, they themselves, Mr. Speaker, tried to establish an international airport and they contracted a group planning and Stanley, Mr. Speaker, to do a survey from Woodford Hill to St. Andrews High School at the time to do an international airport. And that is how the Northeastern Comprehensive School that we have today came about, because they had to shift the school and abandon St. Andrews High School, build a new high school out of the runway path of the airport, Mr. Speaker. And they acquired 530 acres. Some of that, those lands were never paid for. Up to now, Mr. Speaker, you have landowners that, are, that is still being owed by United Workers Party as a, as a result of that, Mr. Speaker. Over 50 years, over 12 airport sites being investigated, Mr. Speaker. La Plaine, Douglas Bay in Bellon, where we now have Kepinski, Cabritz, Point Wrong, Grand Savan, Cane Field, Mr. Speaker, Warner, member for the Mao constituency. Brant Ridge, as I, I have said, they looked at Melvin Hall, Mr. Speaker, Crompton Point, like I've just mentioned, and on and on and on, several sites, 12 airport sites were investigated, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, when we came to power in 2000, Mr. Speaker, we contracted the Halcro Group, who did a report of all of those sites, particularly focusing on the United Workers Party's attempt to establish an international airport, Mr. Speaker, and all of the options. And Mr. Speaker, you know what that report said, the Halcro report? The Halcro report said that the attempt by United Workers Party to establish a scheme Mr. Speaker, a scheme, they called it, was based on flawed demand generation scenarios. In other words, they cooked the books, Mr. Speaker. They cooked the books, that's what it is, Mr. Speaker. And they underestimated the construction costs and the impacts, the economic impacts of that airport, Mr. Speaker. That is what they did. Mr. Speaker, the UWP airport scheme would result in high annual deficits, high annual deficits, Mr. Speaker, to be paid by the taxpayers of the Commonwealth of Dominica. That is the extent 
Mr. Speaker. So that is why I'm happy when I listened to the Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, and the mechanism to be used to generate the revenue to do the international airport will not cost the taxpayers of Dominica one black cent. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, in fact, it is not now that we, were, we have been working on an international airport, you know. When we came to power, we always told the people of Dominica that we want an international airport. But we will never establish an international airport that will be a burden for future generations, Mr. Speaker. We always told the people so. And that is why we established a, com a committee a long time ago you know, of distinguished public servants and other knowledgeable people within Dominica, Mr. Speaker, to look at the establishment of an international airport. And they looked at all of the reports all of the reports, in, including the famous Planning and Stanley report. And when they looked at the Planning and Stanley report, and that is important, because the opposition will try to tell us that this government abandoned the, the plans that the former United Workers Party had for the establishment of the airport. They had no plans for any establishment of any airport, Mr. Speaker. Because the committee, when they reviewed the Planning and Stanley Woodfortill site option, Mr. Speaker, they said, Mr. Speaker, that it limits the dislocation of human settlements within sections of Wesley and Woodfortill. And that is why, Mr. Speaker, the then 1995 to 2000 United Workers Party government, Mr. Speaker, abandoned the, 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 the Alanda, Alexander Gibbs recommendation, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Planning and Stanley report, Mr. Speaker, also called for a curved runway. So you, you would be approaching the, the landing, Mr. Speaker, and half of the runway you would not see. The runway was curved. In other words, a bed shaped runway, Mr. Speaker. That's what I stop. Mr. Speaker, um, I stand here to. I noticed that the minister is quoting from a document. Um, is it is an official document that has been tabled in the parliament? The document doesn't have to be tabled. Yes, what is because, an official government? No. Because you're quoting and you, so, you circulated the parliamentary practice in New Zealand, and I have been reading over it. And it states official doc, the minister, when quoting from a document, ought to present the document that has to be tabled as opposed to the other side where we don't have to do it. So I'm asking, is that document available for my further reading or it, so that I can understand and be better, better guided in my deliberations? But he needs to table that document he's referring to. Mr. Speaker, if I may educate the young senator, Mr. Speaker. The plan and Stanley report. Mr. Speaker, uh, Michael, please. No, the minister is on his feet, so please allow the minister, the minister to respond. Minister, proceed. Mr. Speaker, all of those reports that I quote from are official government reports, Mr. Speaker, and they are available for perusal by any member of the public, any member of this honorable house, any member within the song of my voice. It doesn't have to be tabled. Yes. A document doesn't have to it, be tabled. It doesn't, if it is an official report. government document, it doesn't have to be tabled. Proceed, please. Proceed, my honorable minister. Mr. Speaker, I move that the house be adjourned until 10 a.m. tomorrow, at which time the minister will continue his contribution to the debate. Thank you. Second it, Mr. Speaker. It has, it has been moved and seconded that the House be adjourned until 10 a.m. July 29th, 2021. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. House stand adjourned until 10 a.m. July 29th, 2021. Is that